Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the August 20th, 2018 meeting of the Hingham School Committee um, at 7.07 a.m. PM. PM. <laughs> 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 Trying a new thing to change the time up, anybody? No, sorry, 7 p.m. Um, the first item typically on the agenda would be approval of minutes, but we are a little <laughs> bit behind in getting minutes together. Um, it's a job just for the audience and those at home. It is a job that requires several people to put together because these meetings are, are long and very lots of information goes through. So um, in the summer, it's a little shorthanded on staff at central office and whatnot. So we should have minutes for our next meeting. Um, item three on the agenda is our question and comment period. Um, audience comments are always welcome as agenda items are discussed. But if anybody is here tonight to discuss anything that's not on the agenda, Okay, then we'll move on from there. Um, and number four is our superintendent's report. So Dr. Gallo, your Thank superintendent you. and, report. And the uh, first item of business from the superintendent's report is to introduce our new MECO director, recently hired, Carol Florians. Carol's in the audience, and you did receive a copy of her resume and cover letter. And um, I think John probably wants to say a few words of welcome about what motivated us all to be so excited about Carol's yeah, I mean, candidacy. I, I'm, I'm happy that Carol is on, <coughs> is on board. Um, Carol is, uh, uh, is a previous um, Metco student, a graduate of Hingham High School, um, and since then has actually gone on and got a bachelor's in, uh, from Suffolk in legal, and I forget what it was, but then also a Juris doc a, a doctorate for uh, legal um, from Suffolk Law as well. And um, I think that, you know, uh, Carol's will bring a lot of energy to the program, I believe. Um, she is connected to uh, other METCO alumni, and, um, you know, as she, we were talking to her, I'm sort of really excited at where she's going to take that and where she's going to pick up where Andrew left off and, you know, continue the parent partnership initiative and, and extend that to network. And I, I really encourage about the future. So. I'm really happy she's on board and welcome and thanks for showing up today and we're looking forward to going to start any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> and we want a new yeah. thing, you know, we have the new bus that will be, uh, oh, that will yes. be in place. We have a fair number of new students, which is a combination of some additional uh, student placements that we made and then uh, uh, replacing the students who graduated. So that's exciting. And in fact, we have someone we have to replace just as of what, Thursday or Friday? Yes. Last week, uh, someone who's moving away. And so we have a slot that we'll replace, but at a lower grade level, because we feel strongly about taking the students in when they're in um, first or second or second grade. So. Well, on behalf of the school committee, welcome. And thank you for joining the team. We're really looking forward to working with you. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome back to him. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, enrollment and hiring update. Uh, you have a copy of the elementary uh, enrollment. We've tried to do things a little differently this year to be more efficient, but in some ways it's, a, it's harder to keep track. We created a spreadsheet where as new students um, move in or out, the, uh, uh, the secretary in each building uh, makes the changes immediately. And so in, in theory, we should be up to date at any one point in time. But um, sometimes the total columns don't get uh, changed when one person uh, writes in. But I think as of today, that's, uh, that's about where we, uh, where we are. And typically, this projection we do at the elementary level holds up pretty well for the start of school. Um, the kindergarten production is another matter that changes almost daily, and sometimes a simple change such as a student um, moving from one school to another because of a move, a uh, new house or um, house being built or whatever occurs, and one school gets the change and the other school that didn't change on the same day, and it's really hard to keep track on any one day, but we, we think we're pretty close with what's on that. The, um, <clears throat> in the letter, that we'll talk about in a minute, the August letter that I sent out last week to the entire staff, and, and all of you have it as well, um, said that overall we expect uh, fewer students at the um, elementary 
we expect 40 or 50 possibly fewer students at the middle school and we expect a few more 15 or 16 or so uh, students at the high school the middle school and high school numbers are always very very soft at this time of year because uh, not everybody comes in as promptly as they do in the elementary to enroll or uh, is as prompt to let us know that uh, they're perhaps moving from town or students going to private school or whatever so those are pretty soft uh, soft numbers um, so um, I, I would call your attention in particular to on the left hand side of the chart the number of students in last year's kindergarten and this was at the end of the year at the end of the year it was you know 289 students in kindergarten then if you look at the number of students that are in grade one that typical bump up that we have called it for many years still seems to be there although it's you know a number that's uh, usually in the 20s whereas uh, a few years ago before we had full day kindergarten that bump up factor could be was was between 40 and 60 for many years and that mainly reflected students that were going elsewhere either to a full day program elsewhere or to a preschool program elsewhere uh, and joining us in first grade because we only had the part day kindergarten to uh, to offer so that has changed that number and it's hard to know whether that um, that bump up of students now is simply new families moving to town as their children are entering um, entering school or whether at, at grade one or whether it's some other sort of factor but that that has been bouncing around for a number of years and we really hoped as soon as we got full day and now we're approaching the third year uh, the fourth year and uh, and it hasn't settled down yet so I'm not sure what that uh, what that exactly means um, and with respect to hiring uh, we've hired 30 professional staff that would be include the um, the two new administrators the principal at Foster and the student service or special ed director and um, as and um, 28 teachers uh, to date and I say to date because again that number can change it is a higher number than we anticipated for this year and does reflect a couple of last uh, I shouldn't say last minute as if it were next week but, but later in the game after budget um, retirements and several resignations as well is, is mainly the reason for that that uh, that bump up but we're on top it we had good people in place but uh, it has changed our uh, planning with respect to the mentoring and getting the additional mentors that we need and getting everyone onboarded with the paperwork done and all signed in and so on so it's been a very uh, very busy summer for for that reason it's always busy here in the summer but particularly so because of the um, of the new hires so we're excited about um, the people we have we have a combination of some some good experience and expertise in areas that we needed and also a lot of uh, new young folks who are coming with with good training a good background and some of them coming from our own paraeducator ranks that's become a great uh, kind of feeding system if you will for for teachers because when we have young paraeducators who are taking the job mainly because they haven't yet been able to find a teaching job they're enthusiastic they get to know the system they get to know the players and so when we do have an opening if it's the appropriate grade level there they're good candidates to be considered in the mix and and we hire a fair number of them so that's kind of a, a hint for young people out there that don't yet have a job because elementary jobs are are hard to find because there's such a large pool of very good candidates um, you know the para route at least in Hingham is a good place to, to start it's good for us because we get enthusiasm and good spirit and it's good for them because there's a job opportunity that may result from uh, from that so in the packet you have the letter that I talked about this is the typical August start of school letter and it has information about things like the hiring like the enrollment a summary of some of the facilities uh, updates and changes we've made uh, uh, some discussion mainly from Jamie about uh, the upcoming projects or projects that are in, in underway <laughs> and so on and so we send it out every August um, about in the middle of August and I always say to the new teachers um, when I meet with them 
you're going to, in the middle of the month, you're going to get a letter from me that gives some detail about what we've done over the summer and what's coming for the fall. And I always say to them, and I write it with a lot of enthusiasm about the new things on the horizon, the excitement about the people, and, but I know that when it arrives in people's inboxes, it's not received with the same enthusiasm with which I write it because it's a not too subtle reminder that there's only two or so weeks uh, left for, uh, for the vacation period. Along with the letter in there, you have the uh, schedule that's for the opening days. Uh, the, our administrators, the ones who don't work all summer, the principal certainly are in central office are here in the summer, but uh, for, for the directors and the assistant principals and all of the other members of our leadership team, we have an opening meeting this Thursday at 9.30 in the morning. Um, next Monday, we have in the morning uh, the beginning of the orientation for our new staff. And um, in the afternoon, we have our opening administrative council meeting. The council is uh, made up of directors and principals and those of us at central office. And then you can see on that sheet uh, on Tuesday, the second day of orientation for new teachers. And on Wednesday, what we call the, the general convocation. The convocation really is the only time all year that we have our teachers and our administrators all together in the same room at the same time. So kind of a special day. Uh, and uh, we would welcome uh, school committee members if they're able to attend that. But let Michelle know, because the auditorium is a big place and she wants to be able to introduce you if you're there. Same thing in terms of the orientation on the Monday. Um, Michelle will have a few words of welcome. We'll have someone from the Selectman's Committee as well. And um, again, if you're there, we'd like to introduce you. So let Michelle know of your availability on both of those days. And then with the congregation is the beginning of welcome and greetings and, and words of uh, inspiration, hopefully, and, uh, and then a full day of meetings by departments in the morning and meetings of uh, buildings in the afternoon. Uh, Thursday, there's a freshman orientation uh, at the high school, and um, that's about a two-hour event where freshmen get to meet and hear about things like the activities that are available and uh, a bit about expectations and, uh, and also to do a quick trip around to the uh, classes that they will be, uh, will be attending. And, um, and then that's it for the long weekend, at least for teachers. And um, students will be here, grades 1 through 12 on uh, the day after Labor Day and kindergarten and preschool on Thursday of that week. So a lot going on at this time of year. These two or three weeks are really jam-packed with, with, uh, with things and also with paper and mailings and all of that kind of stuff. Um, age of enrollment report. This is not intended to be a presentation of that report. The report is up on the website. It's been there about a week or so and uh, we think it's a pretty good summary. We hope people will, will read it. I will also mention it when I send out my X2 letter so the greater public will, uh, will know about it. Um, and we didn't anticipate quite honestly that it would be a great change this year because when we got started on this project last year, it was after the year had begun. So there were already families that had held their children out last year and one would expect then we'd have kids that are six entering this year for that reason. Also, I'd remind you that last year we had 10 retentions in, uh, in kindergarten. Um, and so that number last year and that percent was higher because uh, 10 students repeated. That's not typical. This year we have four students repeating and four to six is district-wide is, is a more typical uh, kind of thing. But nevertheless, the percentage is down, is down somewhat. We were also reaffirmed by uh, the number of people who chose to come and meet with our principals. We asked people to do that if they had concerns about their own child's readiness or they had questions about the program or whatever. And, um, and we had a fair number of conferences overall, 26 uh, conferences that were, um, met, that, uh, were initiated by, uh, by parents. We're excited about that, uh, about that fact. And we do believe we learned a lot last year 
and I've got in the report some recommendations for future actions, and one of those is getting started earlier in the fall, likely in early November, getting together with parents so that they don't uh, get all their information from their peers. They have an opportunity to get some information from us, so we'll do, we'll do that again. <coughs> we'll continue to monitor the numbers. Um, and um, there, there's a little bit more detail than that in the, in the report, but I welcome anyone to read it. Um, contact me to comment on it. We would share, most likely share this at one of the initial meetings that we'd have with parents. The new parents this, uh, this fall would be the most likely time for that. But in the meantime, it's there for, it's there for reading. Um, NESDEC enrollment projection. You have the most recent version of that. April, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Doug. I think I'm Carrie sorry. had a question. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. We had all received a communication from a parent about it, um, and it's everyone's really encouraged that it start the percentage of, of older children that are in kindergarten mm -hmm. is starting to come down. Um, one thing that she asked, and I thought if that was um, really good, is whether we could add a, add a target goal for the um, is a certain. So we're at, we were at I think thirteen percent. Now we're at eleven percent. We want we're going to hit more like seven, six, seven percent. Well, I think I said that a goal overall goal last spring when we developed our plan um, was that we bring it more in line with what the average of our comparison group is. Right. So that would still be a goal. I don't know if it's realistic or not. I I am. As I look at the numbers, and I look at the numbers in each building according to how many six-year-olds will be entering and how many five-year-olds, um, they are, with the exception of one or two youngsters, I think, the number of those kids who are six-year-olds, and so you might call them holdouts, or although they might not be a holdout, they might be a child who is longer in pre-K. Right. But in any event, the number of those, uh, of those students the majority of them are, with, with a, a handful you know, of, um, of exceptions, are children that were born in June, July, or August. So that says to me that they're being withheld because of a parent's concerns about readiness as opposed to for some of those other reasons that sometimes are given that mm -hmm. people are holding children out. There's not a reason, there's not any, um, any information that suggests that people are holding kids out for other reasons. I know that people believe that and maybe it's happening, but maybe they're kids in June, July, and August, but, but the vast majority of kids who are entering at age six have those birthdays. Now, do we think that all kids should be held out? No, we continue to say that we think that age five is the appropriate age for most children to enter kindergarten. And certainly the parents who visited with the principals and met with them were people who cited um, immaturity of the child, um, documented medical um, special ed kind of need, um, fear of uh, immaturity, smallest in, you know, physically. Um, and those kinds of reasons that were concerns about readiness and not because they wanted the child to be bigger and stronger and older and some of those other things that seem to be perceptions. Mm -hmm. I don't have ev evidence that suggests that that is a large reason for, for holdouts, so. But is there a plan to, because this is gonna take many years to change, it's changing a culture, right? I think you, mm -hmm. you said that in your letter. It's to move it some, could we have a goal of, I don't know, 9% next year to try to, as, as well, we're I, yeah, I, I don't know how we could monitor or how we could project a particular goal of uh, uh, how could we. I, I guess what, I, Doctor, I, I think the other challenge becomes setting a goal in other people's behavior. So, so we can say we with 100% accurate, you know, we can increase by X percent our outreach or we can have this many more meetings. But, but it's difficult for us to set a goal and then be held accountable to that goal by you with other adults' behavior. So, so what the question was, was will you set a target for enrollment? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question that we're struggling with is so, so well, why, right? So, so what, what, 
what if we don't make that target? Because it's based on incoming kindergarten parents' decision, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where we're struggling with to understand the goal piece. So we can talk about the things that we can control, right? right? But I, I, we stop short at setting goals um, relative to other people's behavior. That makes sense. I guess uh, as far as the why goes, if, for example, you set a goal and it and didn't hit it for next yeah. year, that might be an indication that maybe we need to change the policy. I think there's a fundamental difference of opinion, right, relative to this question. So mm -hmm. some people are of the mind that there should be uh, stricter guidelines and sort of more concrete sort of direction, and other people don't. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I, we find ourselves caught in the middle <laughs> between two uh, very polarized points of view on a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to get, get out of people's family decisions and, and run a school district, and that requires setting appropriate guidelines and sort of expectations. Like Dot said, we expect all of our students to come to us, mm -hmm. right? If a particular family has real concerns about their child and the child's child development, um, then we want to make sure that we're there for them, that we pr make sure they're aware of all the resources that we can provide. And sort of that's the position we've been taking. We've been stopping short, because um, in that same communication, there was also a suggestion that we inst institute some kind of a punitive uh, sort of punishments for people and, and that it just crosses a line that I'm really uncomfortable going down relative to you know you have to make the decision of what's I, I hear so the, the, what makes it complicated right is is we do, it's not that we don't hear you right we hear that other side of the argument that you know they should enroll and they should be with their same age peers and where we feel like we're the best place for them the reality of that situation is um, it's going to take time. And so, so I'm not suggesting we don't have a goal where we continue this work um, or, or we continue the outreach to the preschools. I think we got a lot of positive feedback about that last year. Right. I'm just thoughtful about sort of um, inappropriate overreach into um, people's lives when I think when we sat down and reviewed those students who were not registering, mm -hmm. um, they were legitimate, thoughtful discussions with administrators who are trained and licensed to make these decisions. And I mm -hmm. think that's where the decision needs to rest is with the principal and the parent. Um, for uh, so I, it's not so I think that's there. There's other people who have a different opinion, <laughs> right? Right on, on what we should do and how we should proceed. And I think. Um, we've done our part to sort of be really open and hear the concerns and hear, and we're trying to understand the decision making. So going into this, this past school year, the commitment we made was to listen and sort of to, to be more thoughtful into the decisions that people had that didn't enroll, right? So that's where if you weren't thinking of enrolling, reach out to the principal, we want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, the principal sort of unanimously felt after those discussions that the, the family made the appropriate decision based on the information they had. I, I think that a bigger, um, a bigger conversation to the policy piece is, you know, really up to the committee to decide whether or not you want to put these arbitrary limits mm -hmm. and rules and then which we will enforce. But I think the recommendation from your leadership team mm -hmm. will never be <laughs> to be restrictive to a parent's right to make the right decision for their child. Mm -hmm. Sorry, did someone have a comment? Okay, so, uh, no, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. You have to come up to the mic. No, you have to oh, sorry. Okay, great. Sorry. Just the, and, uh, all the viewers at home won't hear you if you're exactly, not. Exactly. Yes. And then it's just a big your break. name and address. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alyssa Stone. I'm for Oak Crest Road. I just had a, a clarification question. Then, so, so for this year, the families who had children who um, Hingham would consider age appropriate were then just required. Were they required? Or was it suggested that they go meet with the meet it was the? Suggested. It was suggested. We didn't require. It. It was okay. Not required. And and part of what makes that a challenge, right, is mm -hmm. we don't know who they are. Yeah. So so I know uh, who lives in town based on the census report, and you fill out your census and you tell us who's in your house when they were born. So mm -hmm. the town clerk gives us a master list of the people who are residents in the community who we think will be coming to school. So we have okay. some sense of here's our like our, our total n right. But that's actually not who actually arrives. And so what okay. makes this slightly more complicated is I think there's a perception mm -hmm. that we somehow know who yeah. all the enrolling five-year-olds are, right? And that's just yeah. not accurate. They, it, because some families who, who might be on the census actually could go to Derby 
for sure. eight years and never show up on our doorstep at all. And we don't go looking saying you were supposed to enroll, <laughs> right? And so I think that that's part of the challenge. And so mm -hmm. we, we, we can't have a requirement that says if you're gonna hold out, you have to come meet with us because we could have people that move in like next week, right? And right. didn't realize that they had to do that. In the f so that's where the, the, the but that came a little tricky. I think that's the other piece to be thoughtful of is we don't mm -hmm. actually know who these people are. We know the okay. people who are in town, who are living here, might have siblings in school, and you kind of all know they're coming up. Sure. But I think the, the number of families who move in in any given year uh, makes that really challenging to catch all. So to make a that hard and a fast rule for all people who register, that's where it gets tricky because yeah. we don't know who they are. And also, uh, we did a lot of research this year with respect to that list that we've always called the census list. You know, you're asked to fill out a census if you live here mm -hmm. in January about the number of children in your, in your family. You're, and it, it really isn't a census in the sense of counting people. It's much more an updating of the street list that the town clerk keeps. Right. So when, uh, when the enrollment period has ended and even into the summer, we end up with a number of children this year or something like 25 children families mm -hmm. that were on that list that never showed up now at the same time there are another 60 or 70 families who showed up that weren't on the list mm -hmm. maybe they were new move-ins maybe there were people who didn't fill out the list we don't know but we got so frustrated this year trying to track because we track were trying down. to track everyone sure. and 25, the reality is are, you can't you know key right? I mean, to all the kinds right. that we even had uh, my secretary was making phone calls. Uh, Debbie Stella was out visiting addresses that we had, knocking on doors. Wow. And we found out several interesting things. One is that there were a fair number of names on that list that we call a census list that had already moved from Hingham. So why were they on that list? Well, they were on that list before January and because they didn't make any changes, Eileen, on. the town clerk, only records changes. Mm -hmm. So they, some of those families had actually moved away two years ago, and no wonder that we weren't able to connect with them. That makes sense. Most then that the, requirement then would right. be and so right. Right. Most, of the, tricky. most yeah. of the other families that we finally were able to track down um, had made other plans. Okay. And when they tell us, for example, we're going to the conservatory. Well, the conservatory runs a kindergarten program and a pre-K program, and we don't know which of those. Some of those children were going to, um, a couple of them I think were going to St. Paul's. Some did say that they were going to another preschool, but that's ne not even a complete list of who we will have for next year. Right. I believe that the list is going to be down next year, partly because there were only four retentions in the current class. Uh, there are some students that we know that are going to another school. We don't know the nature of the school when a family says we're going to, what's the name of the school in Norwell? Which one? Ridge Hill. Inley? Ridge Hill. No, Ridge Hill. Well, they could be going to Ridge Hill for kindergarten or not. Um, mm -hmm. and I can see that. I think there's a point at which we want to identify where the families are, but I think yeah. it's really intrusive to call families and say, we just want to know, you know, yeah, we need where you're to going know. if they haven't offered. Uh, well, I was offered really that, encouraged so. to hear about so. and see the report back about how many meetings there were mm -hmm. with principals and, I think and that will the discussions. Grow next year. I think, I think that's the really word encouraging will get around. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, it was an intrusive meeting that was mm -hmm. had, I think it was congenial. I yeah. think the principals listened to what the parents had to say, and in almost every case, those parents who came had a genuine concern about development, yeah. and the principals, in almost every case, agreed that those children really could benefit from another year, or and had all. already done another year in preschool, and just by, by yeah. nature of the situation, we're mm. going to be six years old. Or enrolled, uh, sure. right? So there, enrolled. there was a decent yeah. number that had the meeting and enrolled, right? That's so great. It, so it, it was sort of a... Um, I mean, there were certain schools where almost all of the families that met enrolled. Yeah, and I want to make a comment about that because I think there was an unfair comment in the letter, quite honestly. Um, so in one school, there were eight uh, parents who came in, and um, none of the eight enrolled. One of the eight just enrolled in first grade last week, so that changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in that building is a preschool, our entire preschool. 
last year in that preschool number that at, by the end of the year was 75 students there were 45 students with special needs ages three four and few five-year-olds in the preschool and so the folks that came in to see the principal came in to see Tony mm -hmm. So it's a totally different population than in the other schools. And so Absolutely. I just want to make that clear that there are reasons that the numbers varied from yeah. one school to, de to the other in terms of who came in. So. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Another sorry. hand. Yeah, sure. Come on up. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Abbott. Um, just, and I apologize, I'm tardy for the meeting. Um, but just thinking about um, what Carrie was saying with regard to building a community culture and how we're responding to this. My concern, my kids are a little bit older in the elementary school system. Two of them went to preschool at, with Hingham. One went to a private nursery school. All of their directors said my kids were ready to go to school. Yet at some point throughout, and their pediatrician said they're, you know, maturing, everything's you know age appropriate at some point you get through the system and the discussion of holding your child back comes up because you have kids in the classroom who are 18 months 15 months 12 months older than your child so it is kind of challenging so I mean I I completely understand why it's hard to have a target number um, and I hope that I don't really have a question I'm just sort of like commenting I hope that it's something where we can discuss how we can really keep the kids sort of in the same age range because it, it is unfair and the, in 10 percent of a child's life when they're six years old it's a big deal so um I, I just i'm thinking about the kids that are a little bit older not necessarily just the five-year-olds that are coming out or the six-year-olds that are being held back because that's the norm and hang them well we're trying not to well, make that's, it that, that, right that, that was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. um and I think but it we also can do better norm, at that. Though, I, mean, right? I mean, I think we have to be even clear getting there, started as late as we norm. did last fall, I, uh, last uh, yeah, fall November. I think it makes a difference this year. We'll, we're going to get started even earlier, like in early November, and um, and not so much to convince people who are already convinced that their child needs another year and even can document it, but to have everybody have an open discussion about it, and even for children who need um, another year. There are things that we can provide. We came across some some of the families mm -hmm. last year in our uh, in our farms where they didn't know the resources that were available in the school, whether it was part of the preschool program or uh, services for things like speech language or that kind of thing. So good to, if you have concerns about the readiness, good to have the discussion because there may be some other information, mm -hmm. not necessarily entering age right. five, but some other information that we can provide those parents with that would be helpful. I agree. It's uh, just, go ahead. I, I, well, I, I, just, I, don't, I, I don't think you heard me, say, uh, heard us say that we're not going to have a goal. Oh, no, no, yeah. I think what we were sort of thoughtful of and responding to a was number. a target yeah. percent of holdouts or, right. it, 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 it's not, um, so then it becomes, so then what if, um, Well, is it like an so, internal goal? Well, I, I don't understand. Yeah, I, I mean, think like there's more sort of thoughtful discussion to happen around that. I'm not saying it's not an important topic. I don't want anyone to misunderstand, but to say if you don't, so what happens if we don't get to seven? Per, I, I'm just not understanding the target, that percent, and and it, because it's based on uh, adult behavior, and so we're right. working actively. Not ours. To, uh, not right, ours. Yeah, no. So we're at working to sort of change people's perception, to open up their their thinking, to sort of bring us their concerns um, and sort of sort of work right. with resources that can help and explain and uh, well, I like I thought my kids were fine I and mean, I keep using my own personal experience that's all I know but I you know thought that they were always fine and we haven't retained any of them um, but to go to school and see that it kind of feels like your child's being compared to another student who should be in a different grade yes if my child stayed back in an, a, the grade well I'm sure he would be more successful than he is at this point but he's also this is great appropriate i mean but again maybe not by hingham standards that's that's my mm -hmm. only point but look at the number there i think it's 33 uh, now 32 um i think um where is the 
And I don't think all parents hold back. It's just think it's it's something that I've spoken to with other parents who it's been brought to them as a recommendation or a suggestion. It just seems like it's a very high incidence of suggesting their child be held back. And then, you know, we're trying to get away from. So, I think this whole exercise is to try and move in the direction of having, uh, giving parents information about when your child is age appropriate. And I think a lot of progress has been made. Learned a lot talking to the preschools too of mm -hmm. what information they were providing. Um, but also, and I can speak to my own personal experience, the teachers in Hingham, and I think our whole philosophy is teach that individual student. I have a child who was the youngest because we moved her ahead. Mm -hmm and she was the last class. <laughs> I think she was the last kid allowed to do that in the Hingham Public Schools. Um, so she went through always being the very youngest. And then I, I don't have one that's old. I have a, a one that's a little old for the grade, but within the class. Um, so I th we all have to think of our own child right. and make sure that we're paying attention to our own children and I know I have kids in college now that it goes, everyone goes through their maturities, yeah. but the teachers are very attentive to looking at that individual child. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's most important for our own individual children. And if we can all use this exercise to help parents keep that in perspective of don't just compare your kid to another kid because it's your own individual child. And so if we can use this exercise to get that message out, that maybe we can calm yeah, down all of it. Yeah, I hope it's successful. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> so, I mean, to that point of community culture, yeah, but let, let's reinforce our teachers are paying attention to the individual Oh, child. completely. Teachers, yeah. 100%. No. Yeah. No, I think. And, and, I guess, and the I, total number today is 32. 32 kids who will enter at age six. And four of those children, um, and 22 of those children were born in June, July, or August. Four were born at some other point um, in the year. So that's a little over 11%. So, so this perception that some folks have of, of walking into a classroom and having half the kids be six and my child's only five, it's just not, it may feel like that, but it, it's just the not numbers true. just it's don't suggest accurate. that. Right. And it's decreasing too. Um, but I guess my comment about the, the number, it's more of a, it's not so much, you know, hold you accountable for this, it's more to measure, so you're trying to change the culture and do this in a way by educating parents and working with the preschools, and it's more of a way to measure whether we can do it that way, or mm -hmm. there are other mm -hmm. towns that do have more a stricter yeah. Yeah. cutoff, and do we need to do something like that? It's more information, I think, for us than um, you know holding you accountable for our parents' behaviors. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It so does, but I guess how would that be different than just seeing the number go down next year too? So, so it, now that it's sort of in the forefront of our thinking and yeah. we're actively monitoring it and our, our principals are, I mean, our principals, remember, uh, sort of took time out of running a school uh, to sort of have all these, in which they were happy to do and actually really appreciated the opportunity to build a relationship with the families right as they were entering the school. So that's fair. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're watching it. So I, I guess the, the, the next, the, the question becomes, so a, a, a goal at X percent um, that you don't meet I mean, I, I would turn it over to the committee. I mean, if, if you're comfortable with that, I mean, I'm just thoughtful about setting limits on adult behavior when we can see a, a trend beginning and sort of not giving it time to, so to really play itself out. We knew going, like Dot said, when we started this last year, we'd already missed the holdout from the year prior, right? right? So, so this is going to be our first year where everyone's sort of on notice. We will have the forums in November. We're pulling everything up earlier. Our meetings with the preschools are starting sooner. And actually, our relationship with the preschool has really grown. So we've right. sort of received some, um, you know, thoughtful feedback about comments they receive from teachers. Or, and we yeah. reached right out to the directors and said, can you help us solve, problem solve this? Because this is, this is a challenge for us. And so how can we work on this together? Mm -hmm. So they've been right there with us. Yep. Um, and so, I, I, again, I'm not, I, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not at all saying we, we won't have a goal. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just thoughtful in the co in the the comment in the in the letter we all received. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded a little more targeted and a little more focused um, when I would want it to be a little bit broader. That's all. Okay. And we have to realize that our our overall special ed population in our schools is 13.4 percent. So mm -hmm. let's say 13 to 14 percent, and. Um, so one would expect that in every grade that would be about the percentage of students we would have um, with special needs. Now not all children with special needs are going to repeat kindergarten right. but from um, or, or are going to enter at age six. But from those who do, they tend to be children with significant needs and significant developmental challenges. And I would hate to think that anyone would think that their child was less than he or she is because they don't meet a a percentage uh, a percentage target. So, changing the culture is important to do. Changing the number of children, and we didn't find any of those children whose parents said, "I'm holding him out because I want him to be bigger to play football in the high school." Nobody said that to us, and you can argue, well, nobody would be that <laughs> blunt, but you know, perhaps they, <laughs> perhaps they would. Uh, but we didn't find those people, and so unless they were in the summer, the summer months, born in the summer months, I'm not sure, but, um, but there should be some <clears throat> of our, our youngsters. We know there are some children out there, uh, and, 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 and m many of them children with special needs, but certainly not all. We, the vast majority of our kids with uh, special needs are fully included. They'll start school on time. They'll they'll end their uh, high school career on time, and whatever developmental or other kinds of challenges are there, we'll work with them on that. So, so it's important to know that a number of these children have special needs, but it's not it's not all, and it's not an expectation that someone wouldn't be able to start school with all of his or her yeah. peers at age five. I think we're not being clear. So I, I, um, I think where the comment's coming from is of the kids who are being withheld, there were a proportion of them who had uh, significant disabilities that required sort of individual decision making. So <coughs> without disclosing too much personalized information about our enrollment, I think that's where Dot's coming from is that we have to be thoughtful that a number isn't a number. Right, so right. so w we can count a number, and I think if we may have taken out kids with disabilities, we might see a different person. So I think um, that's what we're trying to convey: is that everyone's unique, everyone has their own um, individual development, and um, what's important is that they we have communication with those families, we have communication with the preschools, and we we're watching it. And I think that's the other the the thoughtful piece here is: so as we go, in, go into next year, um, will we see even a more significant drop? Mm -hmm. than over the two or three percent that we saw heading in from this year, from just really starting in January, if right. you think about it. Mm -hmm. It was so kind of late in the game. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like the word is out. We're, we're watching, we're discussing, we'll, we'll you know, it, it's more of a, um, a, a it, it, sort of a, it's more of a, of a higher level discussion that we're having to think about practice and, and, cult and what we know about culture change, right? It takes mm -hmm. four to five years mm -hmm. to begin to change a culture. That's yeah. just what research will tell us how it plays itself out. I'm not saying we, we sit around and wait for four years. I'm saying we have to be thoughtful that what we're trying to do is actually impact long-term change instead of, instead of short-term gain. Mm -hmm. right. And you've been standing. Do you want to come up to Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Three Cypress Circle, um, just in terms of the goal, I mean, I think it was just stated from the beginning that it would just try to be at the same level as peer districts, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's where that goal is coming from is sure. because that's what it was stated initially last fall. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that hopefully we'll get really close this year and even closer the following year, but that's where that number actually comes from, right? Sure. right. So it's not right. like arbitrary. Oh, no, okay. it was presented to us that way. But right, right. No, I, I get it. No, I know I get it. I get what I you're saying. We're, I'm just saying. we're feeding in a lot to the word goal when goal is what we uh, have to all do as educators because of educator evaluation system. We have to set goals and we're expected to, to reach those goals. But those are things, actions that we control. Right. right, right. And when you set a goal in the context of other people doing the acting, <laughs> that makes it challenging to... Uh, to come up with the with a number that we think is. I mean, I think our goal is to be aligned with our benchmark community. Okay. So that yeah. that's fair. Right. It's 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 nailing down. You want to? I want to be. Our goal is to be at seven, or seven point five. Or right. I, that's the part right. where I just it doesn't. It's still pretty far from there, even. Yeah. So we'll see next year, but hopefully it will be 
much closer. We're getting there in right. one year. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Now that's the other it's thing great. That we don't know, and I was thinking about this a bit today, is that we don't know how other communities respond to the question of how many holdouts you have. So in other words, that data from all those other benchmark communities, you know, we don't know how other communities may well, count. Um, they're just retentions. asking the ages of the, mm -hmm. their students mm -hmm. just by date of birth. So to your point, it doesn't necessarily bring in any develop, it doesn't show any develop, doesn't mm -hmm. make any space for that in the data, right. but the data is actually by birth date. Okay, so, so. that's, it was actual enrollment and date of birth. Right, exactly. Right, so that okay. should be pretty. Yes, clear. it should. Right. I was. Right. I didn't know how the data. Yeah, that is. I mean, I think that. From, whether it I think that when people are thinking of a deadline, they're thinking of anything that would be not hitting that deadline would be considered a holdout. But I mean, I don't. I base. I wanted to pretty much just give a little bit of feedback on the process this year having been mm -hmm. a recipient of the communication and I would just say that mm -hmm. in terms of the preschools um, on the board of the preschool that my son just graduated from and I thought it was really helpful the forums I think answered a lot of questions I think the kindergarten teacher presentations were extremely helpful the assistant superintendents feedback in the presentation was extremely helpful but I will also say that there are some people who had their mind made already and maybe didn't attend. And I think that the information that you might be trying to find in terms of people that are on the census or you can't track them down is, as you're saying, at the preschools. Mm -hmm. So if you're really set on getting the kids into the right grade by age, just ask Wilder, just ask the nursery, who are the seven kids that are doing a third year at Wilder next year? Because those are the kids that are gonna be older the following year. You're already getting those communication lines broader and more mm -hmm. open and I think it's sim I think it's probably more simple than using the census. I mean, there's only X preschools, so it's not that hard to kind of figure out who's doing that PG year after they're graduating from pre-K. Um, but I know there are like kindergarten programs at conservatory and all of that. But you know, I think that then there should be follow-up. Like, okay, so your kid's doing a year at conservatory. There might be a June birthday what's your plan? Are you sending them to kindergarten or will they start first at Hingham Public Schools when they come? I don't think that's intrusive. I think people kind you, you of know. Don't, you don't think that's intrusive? I don't think so because I think people know and I don't think they're shy about sharing that in, within the community because it's not yeah. like a, you know, it's not seen as nobody gives any judgment about that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't think so at all. But they might very well say, well, we'll see how he does or see how she does and we're still deciding. That's up to you how you receive that but I don't think that that information is as out of reach as you might think just as somebody who has the information <laughs> um, it, that you would maybe maybe I am holding my son you know like you don't necessarily know I don't think it's that as hard as you're maybe thinking I, but I also think that that's where we're getting at the fundamental we have a, I just don't fundamentally see it that way right it, and, and what I mean by that is is um, I mean the 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 the, the People have a right to privacy, right? And so for me to pick up Wilder and say, give me the names of your, that, that, that what would happen? And I don't mean that dismissively. I mean that the reality is, unless you've signed a release for them to give us information, they're not going to tell us who these people, right? That, that we really don't have, they're not a part of our system. Do you know what I mean? That where they're independent schools. Right. And so, and they also have call, call on families from all other communities, right, who may also go to school in those preschools. Uh, so it's not just Hingham families. No, I'm just saying, like, if there are those few that, like, you're saying <laughs> the principals are knocking on their door and they shouldn't be spending their time doing that and you can't find them, like, you probably would be able to if you were really, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just. Well, I think. Well, no, we, we found them. We okay, just, good. Oh, that wasn't the but impression that I got. Of, uh, we found them. I agree. Staff, right, I think that that's effort. wild. And that was mainly <laughs> around people that weren't responding when we had contacted them. Right. That's frustrating. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's not. I, I guess so. The, I mean, the, the other, I mean, what I meant by that, we're at a fun, the disagreement is around, so, so there are people, like you said, who already made up their mind. And I guess you're wanting us to manage them is really, that's where I get lost, right? So no, I can, totally. I can, that's I can, not I can at all what I'm up, saying. I'm just. No, I'm, I'm saying, sorry I, I can set up structure, I can set up information, I can set up resources, but I can't make. Mrs. So-and-so, right, send their child. Right, absolutely. 
I completely understand and agree. I would just say that when <laughs> there's the discussion in the report and also a little bit of the discussion tonight about thinking that some of this information is out of reach, I don't necessarily think that that's true to say, like, we don't know the exact number of people. Like, you can probably. We can't, honestly. Well. For the reasons we explain. Okay. I mean, it, I mean, if you'd like to sit down separately and we can talk more about no, how you not think we at all. Better, I just, I'd be more I than just happy wanted to, to to offer that the feedback. feedback. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Because I think that that's, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, lost in, you know, in terms of trying to figure out who's who and where they go. And oh no, we're going to keep trying. Yeah. I, I, I and you shouldn't we, we necessarily like have to tell important. people what to do. Yeah. Not at all. That's not what I meant. It's just in terms of like, there's all of this like abstract data that we can't necessarily account for there's obviously people moving in and out there's obviously a lot of factors but there are factors that i feel like could be you know played into your process in terms of trying to identify people and what they're doing for staffing and for reasons that aren't necessarily intrusive like i don't think that that's it should be confusing to people to know like it's going to be th you know three classes versus four we'd like to get a sense it's only fair to the teachers it's only fair to the other students sure. and you know that's that's not intrusive in my opinion. It's like a community, so everybody should be looking out for each other and thinking about the budget and all of that. I think it's important, so. Agreed. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Kay, did you want to say? I just wanted to say just a few words to the discussion tonight, because I was on policy last year when we um, discussed this policy about kindergarten age, <coughs> and um, the consensus was, for those members that were on policy last year, was to really, let's try outreach, Let's do some things differently than we haven't done in the past. And let's see where we go with this. And let's sit back and, and see are these um, helping or you know, are our efforts actually being productive? And, um, and let's see what kind of trend we create. And I think it's a little bit premature right now to see a trend just after you know, starting this new of program that um, the administration has done with this outreach and I hope it continues I applaud you really and hopefully we'll get some feedback um, I know that you've also done some outreach to some of these independent kindergartens which mm -hmm. we haven't done before so the consensus then was let's wait before changing policy so quickly and see what our efforts Produce and I think right now these are the first numbers that we're seeing, and I'd like to see more of them. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so to wrap it all up, um, I think this has been an excellent mm -hmm. collaboration of people, right, between the parents who did a lot of data and brought it to the attention, the administration, and at the, particularly at the schools and at central office who have done anything, the policy subcommittee. So I think uh -huh. that it the early results are encouraging, right? So it looks like we're moving in a better direction than we were. Um, and I think that there's still a lot of pieces of this puzzle that we need to put together. Um, the administration has to continue their outreach to parents and educating parents on when it's what is age appropriate. Um, and I think um, if really the, the real goal here is we have to change the culture, as has been said a few times by different people. And I think with the school <coughs> committee, goal could be is potentially, that's why I was pointing at you earlier, that maybe community outreach takes that on as one of their goals to just sort of help with that culture change as we, as we move through with the younger parents, right? And sort of maybe have some listening sessions, some coffee things, whatever it takes to sort of get at least a school committee helpful, helping to make that cultural shift for parents. So, all right. So thank you everyone for your comments and your work on this. It's greatly appreciated. So Dot, do you have the NESDEC enrollment report? Now? Yes, um, I have, uh, the, I guess I would call it the final, final draft uh, because we uh, have made some suggestions to improving it and uh, other information to be included, which uh, information was included. Um, the report is uh, a fairly thick report, but much of it is really background information as to why the projections are what the projections are. Um, I did involve the um, Foster School Building Committee um, last, um, at the beginning of the summer, I guess it would say. No, it was last spring, earlier than the school got out to take a look at this, and because of course it's an area of their interest, particularly because of the SOI for, for Foster being in place. So I, I did point out to you in the um, 
annotated agenda that there were a few pages that really were about the actual number of students that's projected that you should pay attention to um, and read, certainly read the rest of it. I do think it's important for the Long Range Planning Committee, um, I'm talking directly to the Long Range Planning Committee now, <laughs> so uh, I think it's important for the Long Range Planning Committee to perhaps schedule a meeting where we could talk just about this with, uh, with detail because this is of interest not because of the foster project but not just because of that but also because it's part of the um <laughs> of the master plan report that's um, got lots of pieces to it and but just about put together and we are waiting for this as one of the, uh, the pieces so you know it uh, projects some slower growth than we've had but continuing slow growth uh, nothing um, shocking about that and nothing of concern about that as well because I think the growth is modest enough that we can say four schools that's the right number that we should have and four sections in each school seems to be the right number of, uh, of, uh, of sections um, when we do work with the MSBA we will work with them together on coming up with a design build number and and when I say we the uh, building committee and, and those of us like John and I who who sit on that committee ex officio um, so we'll be working with them to come up with what the design build number will be for the either renovated or new foster schools so um, so it's a timely report interesting reading it's on the website um, so we just had a long discussion about something it really was supposed to be if you want to read the report, go to the website. So the prior discussion was, if you want to read the whole report, go to the website. And we had a discussion, which is fine. If people had interest in coming to talk about that, that's, uh, that's fine. But this is just making you aware that it's complete. They do intend to look at our October 1 numbers uh, when we get them and to revise the few pages that would need to be revised for them because the October 1 numbers each year are the ones that we base our conclusions on. And so just to be consistent that our, our baseline year number is as accurate as it can be, we don't want to just use the projections that we just talked a bit about. We also want to use what's real kids showing up in school, uh, with, and that's represented by October 1. So then after the October 1 numbers, then it's the final report? Yeah. OK. Um, I. I found the data, especially the housing and the building mm -hmm. permits, interesting because there's a yeah. real shift. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm assuming you do this, but I think it would be helpful if when the October 1 numbers are done, we shared this with the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, and the Advisory Committee yeah. because there's a lot of town-wide data in here, and then it would be good for them to mm -hmm. see that, you know, the population is going to maintain itself. Um, mm -hmm. and, but. I think they would be yeah, interested in the good. housing data um, too mm -hmm. and yes. some of the demographic information. So. Right. I would think that that would be the intent of the school building committee. Uh, well, why don't you bring that back well, to yeah. the school building committee? To now, now, this report. Or jointly, we can do it jointly. With this it. report is also Im important for the long range planning right. on the right. master plan. Yeah. But they, I, I would think the. Uh, well, the school building committee has seen it in its first draft. And its they first made draft. several suggestions, <coughs> and this is now back, so yeah. I will share that with them. But um, there uh, actually wasn't so much suggestions, additions of information that they wanted here. Yeah. They wanted a little bit more detail about the projections for the two big new yeah. projects. And so there's a page in here that wasn't in here before. So there was not, in terms of changes, there were not changes in the numbers, but just requests for more or clearer or more consistent information, that kind of thing. So we will get it back to them. Um, and um, and a good idea to get it to uh, others as well. Of course, that's hoping that we get chosen this year, because every year, of course, the data gets older um, yeah. and um, perhaps not as uh, relevant. In projections like this, they'll say five years out is, is a good projection yeah. uh, because those are children who are born, and, and we can count on those numbers. Um, 
from the five to ten years out the past projections we've had done and I can think of three of them two of them coming from this uh, firm um, have been pretty accurate yeah. even going out all ten years so. yeah and that'll be interesting in five years when the big complexes but just as a general are built, interest um, that could change it's available mm -hmm. okay. if people would like to see it um, in your packet uh, um, is the sheet that gives the um, July and August facilities report for um, from Doug and Katie and I was amazed as I looked at it first of all how much has been accomplished over the summer but secondly how much of this is about routine maintenance and um, and preventive maintenance, PM, <coughs> report, preventive maintenance, an amazing number of items that are about preventive maintenance. So, so good thing is that we're doing those things. I don't think we <coughs> in prior years had ever spent as much um, time and effort in doing those kinds of things. On the other hand, we didn't have as sophisticated buildings as we have now that require a lot of and a lot more of preventive maintenance because the systems that heating and ventilation systems in particular, the, the uh, electronics components of those systems are all very, very different in the newer, in the newer buildings. But I'm pleased with what has, uh, what has been accomplished and what's ongoing because they've got here what they did in July and what they're working on now in, uh, in August and a lot of great things. A number of these things were repeated um, in the letter that you have sent home that were highlighted and Doug wanted me in particular to make sure I mentioned the high school auditorium. You know, there's a building that for many years has had a noisy heating and ventilation system, almost to the point where when we had presentations or plays or musical events, you just wanted to shut the thing off. No, well, they did. <laughs> we they did, did shut it they off. They did shut it off. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to give no. all the details, but you're right. We did shut the system off temporarily. But we found that the system, uh, there were some design flaws as well as other issues. Those we have been remedied so that um, when we all go there on the 29th, hopefully it'll be quiet and not vibrating. And that's a masterful feat to get that resolved after all these years that that building has been open. So congratulations to Doug and Katie and their, uh, and their team. We're excited about, about that. Okay, moving on. Moving on. Item five, communications. You're still on. <laughs> communications. <laughs> well, I put some information in your in your packet for a couple of reasons, but but one, it's we talk often about the cherry sheets, and well, this is really what the cherry sheet information is. It's a two-sided thing in your packet. I'm having. Let me see if I can get to the actual document. On. Moving slowly here. I don't know what the. There we go. There. Okay, and I can't enlarge that as much as we would like. So the cherry sheet isn't cherry colored. Years and years ago, when everything was uh, was paper and not uh, not electronic, the cherry sheet data was on cherry colored sheets and bright and stood out so so here it all is and so there are two pages here make sure we have the right one of them one of the pages is assessments I'm going to go to the other one first and the other page is the local Local aids, local aid estimates and the assessments. I know, you know what I'm. One. Okay. So here are the local aid estimates. So it's the shorter of the two sheets. So this shows you the estimate and for FY18 and then um, the conference um, committee, which those were the decisions that were made at the budget. Um, at the budget time and you can see the differences and how much money is anticipated to come into town. So the total amount of money estimated uh, for the coming year, 9,405,541. State aid, total state aid to Hingham, as opposed to FY18, 
8,983,250. So there's a good, um, there's a good increase there. Um, the biggest uh, piece of that, the biggest single piece of all the town aid that Hingham gets is Chapter 70. And that's 7,492,625. And it is an increase over, if you go back to 18 of 350 or so, roughly $1,000. And Chapter 70 is what we talk a lot about in terms of the formula. There's a formula for Chapter 70, and the formula includes knowing how much more costly it is, or estimating how much more costly it may be to educate children that have special needs, or children that are ELL, or even children that are, are so socioeconomically disadvantaged. So there's a formula. And that formula um, hadn't been updated in a long, long time. So in 2015, there was a commission um, that was put in place. A commission worked for a long, long time in coming up with recommendations that would change Chapter 70 and therefore bring more money into communities that um, were being woefully underfunded, particularly in terms of the student populations that they had. So the commission made all kinds of recommendations and we've all been waiting, you know, anxiously for those recommendations to be met. The problem is that those recommendations added up to more than $2 billion and how is that ever going to happen? And that's what we've all been struggling with the last, uh, last few, few years. But in any event, in this, in this year's budget, the budget coming up, there is an increase. Um, the next page is going back to, up against that money coming into town, that nine million plus dollars, against that are all kinds of assessments. And some of them uh, don't change much from year to year. But overall, if you look at the number, all of the dollars in the assessments, and you look down to the bottom, so there was nine, 150,290 assessments last year, the year that just ended, FY18, and now it, there's a, a little more than a million more, so that's only about $50,000. So if you take the um, revenues that we anticipate coming in, which largely are um, Chapter 70 items and a couple of other school items, and then you look at the um, assessments, and you subtract those out, we've got about $350,000 more that will come into Hingham uh, next year. Um, and all of those dollars, uh, including the Chapter 70, all of the dollars come to the town and then they're allocated out as part of the budget and they are a big part of these two areas, the things that are in the assessments and the and the total town aid of establishing the revenue forecast that the town does um, each year starting in the in the fall. So it's good information for you to have to have a better understanding of what kind of state aid the town gets and where most of it comes from but also all of the things that are charged against it. And so uh, I put it here. I know that somebody's going to ask me a couple of questions, so I'll answer the ones I think you're going to ask. And one is if you go to the assessment page where it says school choice sending tuition, uh, that just popped out at me. And I went to John and said, we, we don't have school choice. We've never had school choice. Where the heck does this number come from? John made a uh, phone call to his contact. And that label, I think, is really inappropriate for a label because it isn't about school choice, it's about virtual school tuitions. So you probably are aware that there has been a virtual school in Greenfield. Virtual school means that it's all online. Uh, in Greenfield, Mass, it was actually run by the public school system. It decided they'd come up with this project to run a virtual school. It was money making for them. So children, it's free. Um, not unlike a charter school, but different than a charter school with people, uh, meeting together with people every day. And we have currently four students attending what's now two virtual schools. 
one of them in our area was called the Tech Academy. You may have seen it advertised on TV or in magazines and so on. They do heavy duty advertising. And uh, we have two students at Tech Academy. Now, we don't know who they are. They never have to report back to us. The school doesn't have to report that they have our students there. So they could, in fact, be kids that we never had. They could be kids that have been homeschooled and are now going to Tech Academy. Or we might happen to know who, I think we know who one of them is because the student's parent told us that um, the child was going to be attending there last year. So the, um, the one in Greenfield doesn't attract, for some reason, more of our kids, even though it's online. The new, but there are two students there as well. So that number that says school choice has nothing to do with school choice other than people chose the virtual school for their child. Uh, and that's an assessment. So we don't pay it out of our budget, but it's taken away from, in a sense, the chapter 70 that's on the other side of this, paper, this piece of paper. Scott, are these virtual schools for all eight, uh, grades? Excuse me? Are these for all grades? I've never heard of them. Yeah. So any grade level a student could do a virtual um, school? The Greenfield one is, I'm not sure if Tech Academy starts at the earliest grade. But uh, it would be a particular appeal to, uh, to parents who homeschool mm -hmm. because it gives more formal structure and yet still allows them to control how much time they want the child to be working right. during the day and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so um, the other thing there is the charter so school sending, sending tuition, charter school um, and then the char and that means that we have children at the charter school. We don't get that final count until October. How many there will be? Typically, it's maybe nine, ten kids. <coughs> but there is a very complicated reimbursement situation for charter schools. And it really was intended so that when children enter a charter school unexpectedly, the district gets back a reimbursement amount in the first few years so they can budget, in a sense, for that, for that child. Uh, but the charter school tuition is on this side because that's an obligation we have. And then if you go back to the other side of the paper, there is an offset. getting back to this one there it is so on this side there's a place that says charter school reimbursement and that is the amount of money that excuse me that varies each year by some amount um, and reflects our, the state saying to us you know we'll give you we'll give you a break and to get used to this number so, but that went up to fifty thousand hmm? dollars that went up fifty thousand dollars, though, right? Eh? Yes. From eighteen to nineteen. Well, the reimbursement. You you mean not the, the reimbursement, the the cost. Yeah, yeah, the right. cost. Right. Yeah, yeah one ten to one sixty. Charter school tuition is one ten to one sixty. Charter school tuition is based on the per pupil cost. So our per pupil cost, let's say, it's about twelve thousand dollars. So if a um, student goes to a charter school, then that amount, about $12,000, gets deducted from our Chapter 70, or it's there in the form of uh, an assessment. Now again, we don't always know who those children are, because charter school starts at kindergarten, so it could be somebody that goes there and tends to spend their, uh, their time there. Um, or it could be somebody that moves. We typically would know, know if a student were choosing a charter school over, over Hingham, and we actually do get those names, unlike for the virtual schools. Um, so we'll know as of October 1 how many children are there, and, um, and it's, a, it's a lottery process, so uh, it is free. Charter schools are public schools, and so they are free. Um, and 
something else can I say about charter schools? Well, we'll, we'll at least know who those students are. But if you think a couple of years back when they had that election, you can see how it really does take money away from mm -hmm. public exactly. school, you know, from, from your town, right? Yeah. Because it's going and to fund People would argue, you know, direction. it doesn't, well, so. here's the other right. it, Yeah, any other? You know, and if you, if you went back historically over, you know, a few more years, that these numbers have just been escalated. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You have uh, coaching recommendations there um, in red are the coaches that are new to us. Um, and I believe... under communications yep. we have um, June Gustafson who's president of the Hingham Education Association uh, either, either, either one place either. is fine if you have notes go who has some comments she'd like to make um, June Gustafson from the Hingham Education Association I know uh, Dot just made us aware about um, the budget but I did want to tell you that um, in our most recent legislative session the mass House of Representatives did not pass the additional school funding in regards to the changing um, the recommendations made by the Foundation Budget Review Commission um, and this money is greatly needed not just in Hingham but in all districts and um, I just wanted to express um, our gratitude to Senator O'Connor and Representative Moschino and the Hingham School Committee at this time. And we wanted to make everywhere and everyone in the community aware that um, everyone's working really hard to make this happen for the next session. And I have presents for every <laughs> little stickers. <laughs> thank you for love. Thank you for loving our public schools. Thank Who you. gave us this sheet? Yes, that is, that is a sheet that has been uh, circulated, um, and uh, June sent it to me, okay. and that is the, it, it, it's, uh, unfortunately the title isn't longer, because I don't think it gives you all that you need, but that's the first page of all the cities and towns, and that indicates that uh, Hingham, if the circuit break, if, if the, uh, so if the foundation formula. recommendations were fully funded, the additional dollars to Hingham over the five-year period ending in 23 okay. would be uh, so it's over the five-year period million. that's what so it it's says a cumulative amount it's not yeah. every, each year we would get that much more that's not what no, I heard it's through 23 okay. if you look at so the, the amount time. on this list is one million eight hundred eighty nine thousand seven hundred seventeen dollars so over five years we would get that much more if the formula was revised and if the funds were you were available. Thinking, you said that's not what you thought? Did you think that's it was 1.8 every year? Starting in 2023. Oh. That's what I thought. Oh, that's 1. what I thought. 1.8 million The each note year. at the top of the sheet says, this is how much every city, town, and district will receive by 2023 when we implement a fair yeah. um, updated foundation formula. So, so it sounds as though by, by that then, time, that would be, be the number. It would be up to On that an annual number. basis. Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. Think, yes. Mm -hmm. We would get more money, which is great. Would help all of our students. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I do. We do love our public schools. We do. Thank you, you very yeah. much. Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I guess yes, I I'm just trying to grapple with the fact that in five years it will be 2023. Just five dollars. Like that math count. Oh yeah. It's like science fiction days now. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, June. That was very helpful. Um, item six, um, unfinished business. We have three policies, um, 6.22, 6.3B, and 6.3C, um, where we had the first reading at our last meeting on July 23rd. Um, we didn't have, there's no changes here other than what we had voted on at the last July 23rd school committee meeting. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. Actually, I suggested something at that meeting, um, oh. and we thought, I thought we were in, in agreement that it's not in here. And it was just, it's, it's minor, but it's just to mirror the language in the regulation as far as the access to the records. And um, sorry, on 6.22? Yeah, the, okay. the, the student records. 
Um, the regulation reads, access should be provided as soon as practical and, and within 10 days of the initial request instead of within 10, just within 10 days. And we, we had talked about that, I think, at the last meeting. So yep. could we add that in? Yeah. Yes, we could. Yes. And, and that should be there, because I do remember you making that comment, and we had it in writing. So uh, we must perhaps had an earlier edition here. But thanks for mentioning it, because you did say it. We wrote it down, but yep. this but isn't the version. Yeah, right. So it read, access to these records shall be provided as, as soon as practicable. As soon as practicable. Okay. But yeah. no, but within, within 10 uh, days, yeah. Can we vote on the language as amended? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you, did you want to speak to any of these? Does anybody think? Does anyone want no. us to go? With, okay. All right. So, because we all know what we're voting on. All right. So, do I have a motion to vote on? I'll make a motion to approve the updated 6.22 student records policy. Thank you, Carlos. Discussion. Oh, yeah, Josh, come on up. Joshua Ross. Oh, Wampteck Road. Sorry, I was here for for the last meeting, so I was just kind of thinking about this stuff. The two questions I had with this is that what if someone requests a blanket uh, or blanket request at the beginning of the year saying, I want all of my students' information? Does that address in this? Because I don't know if someone's going to say at the beginning of the year, meeting with the teacher, I want all the tests. Mm -hmm. So does that... We, we have had parents, and that's really the subject of this piece of okay. the law about records, is that the work that we have kept for students, uh, such as in folders, so mm -hmm. they have uh, a math folder and a science folder and so on, that we have always made that accessible to parents because the law required that. Right. And accessible meant you could come in and see it, you know, meet with the teacher or not, meet, have your child meet with the teacher, review it. But this ruling from DESE says that it uh, must be available in paper copy. Right. It's like it's given a, to the, my, my understanding is it has to be given, it can be given to the parents now, right? It can leave the school. Yes. Right? That's correct. Yeah. So reading this, I, I, it's under the impression that they would have to ask for every piece of work or is it cover a blanket request at the beginning of the year saying... So, so well, this policy is, is not... Uh, so I'm going to be really clear. Okay. This has nothing to do with the folders, okay? This the policy is the committee's position on parents' access of student records. And so if, if you wanted something... Uh, first, th so there's, there's also a request for information that you can get under... Um, that is sort of a separate right. piece. But if you're... Um, most of our material is sent home to the families, right? So, so you, to answer your question, like not a, the test though. I, at the secondary level, that's accurate. But I'm I'm talking it's K twelve, right? Okay. And um, most of the student work is is re so to answer your, your specific question, which was at the start of the year, right. I want to get back to the question. Uh, a parent could ask. Explain that again to us. Just if a parent says. Instead of requesting after every quiz or test that they have received copy of the test, and I assume this is what we're talking about, the tests, right? Because that's what I, I, the discussion. I, I disagree that we're talking about tests. We're not talking about tests? No, so okay. records is a broader a, term. A broader term. So, so the, all right, because when we, I thought when this was brought up last time, people were talking about tests. and So there was an issue. I assume that that's what you were talking about, <laughs> whether you could make a blanket request right. to not have to. Certainly we wouldn't expect any parent is going to be looking for um, sending something in after every test but in the beginning of the year there isn't anything in the folder Got it. Okay. so to say I, at I the end of the this. first term I'm concerned or whatever yeah we would expect a written request okay and so that was my next question when you say request is it does it have to be specified how the request is yes. handled? Is it written? Does someone send an email? Does the kid say, I want the stuff? So I was just anticipating questions that are coming up, and so I just thought I'd ask you guys this not. Well, there are, this is the policy. I, there are procedures. Okay. And the procedures go into detail about, um, you know, how, how you make the request, and um, there are some things that can be exempted um, from that mm -hmm. if it's a a commercial uh, instrument, such as an IQ test that's copyrighted, 
um, and the students' responses are on the instruments oh, and things like you. that. There are a few, not a lot, but a few things that can be excluded. Right. There's just a couple so, things I was thinking of as. No, yeah. thank you. And but, but what we also committed to doing in addition to uh, changing our policy to be consistent with the state was we also said that we would put in the guidelines, which right now have always been every department having their own guidelines, similar but written differently. Mm -hmm. We committed to, when school starts, having one set of academic guidelines, and this again is about secondary folders, not about the policy per se, right. that we'd have one set of guidelines for all the departments so that people don't see things that may appear to be different but really aren't, and there's one set of guidelines. So right. that you will be seeing, and all parents will be able to see that information. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. And please encourage parents to talk directly to the administration if they have a question about any of this. Because I you know <coughs> sixth grade parents come in and say, oh, no, we don't really show the test that the face goes white and there are and then, you, and then please encourage right. them to please call the principal yeah. or the teacher and ask them directly. That would be really helpful because this is all going to be changing and they're going to know the most accurate information. Right. And the policy is actually pretty much duplicated the concept that's in the policy in the uh, high school handbook. Um, and the, the documents from the directors, a combined document from them will be uh, available to parents um, through the curriculum piece um, likely will appear in the program of studies and just the other day I did get a, um, a letter from DESC who approved this plan which was to change the policy to get things into the high school handbook not so much the middle school overall handbook because it that has a different format and um, but to get information out to parents this way and they approve that plan and that matter is um, has been concluded in their opinion okay all right thank you any further discussion all right so all in favor of the revised aye, aye. aye. thank you um okay then we have section 6.2 to receive the new policy 6.3b um, this is the education opportunities for children in foster care as recommended by the policy subcommittee do I have a motion to I make a motion thank you to to accept accept the proposed policy um, on educational opportunities for children in foster care thank you and second, second. Carrie thank you any discussion all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. Thank you. Um, 6.3, to receive a new policy, section 6.3C, education opportunities for military children, as recommended by policy subcommittee and first read at their last meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the policy on educational opportunities for military children. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Carrie. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed? Great. Thank you, everyone. Hi, new business, section 7.1, to hear a presentation on the NEASC accreditation report from spring 2018 by Principal Rick Swanson. Hello, Rick, thank you for being here tonight. My pleasure, good evening, everybody. Good evening. And at long last, some discussion about uh, the accreditation of the high school. Mm -hmm. The last time I stood at this podium was, I think, in late March or early April after we had um, finally received our report from the NEAS Commission, uh, produced by the people who had visited us um, almost a year ago now, it was last September, when uh, over at Hingham High School we were visited by 15, a team of 15 um, who had come out as part of our decennial accreditation report. And uh, we, we waited uh, until February for the report to arrive, or the draft of the report, and then March we received the report. And I, I was able to tell you shortly uh, after that that it looked good but that we were you know waiting until the actual vote um, which which of course did lead to the reaccreditation of Hingham High School and then we waited until May for the the next letter to arrive with some of the highlighted commendations and recommendations and um, you've probably had an opportunity to read it by now those materials have been on the website for a while but um, here we are finally on the agenda to give you uh, a little bit of background and, and some additional detail although um, given the hour, I'll try to make a very long story, somewhat short, and, and give you the highlight real version of um, 
the high school's accreditation process. And as you know, the process is administered by an organization called the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, uh, but I refer to them just as NEASC uh, tonight. And their visit, as I'm sure you will recall, happened last September. Uh, we had a team of 15 chaired by Gary Maestas, who is a superintendent of schools in Plymouth. Uh, his assistant chair was an assistant superintendent from Franklin, Joyce Edwards. And there were 13 other teachers, mostly from Massachusetts, but uh, also some of them from other New England states, who spent four days with us, uh, fun four days at the end of September. During that time, they, uh, they really did uh, incredible work in learning as much as they possibly could during a short period of time about the life of our school. Before they had arrived, they had read and really studied the exhaustive self-study that Hingham High School had produced over the course of the previous two years. And then after arriving on a Sunday afternoon, and, uh, and, and uh, most of you had an opportunity to meet them during a, a welcome ceremony uh, on Sunday, they spent all day Monday, all day Tuesday, and into Wednesday shadowing students, meeting with uh, teachers, um, a meeting with many of you, meeting with small groups of various stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, interviewing all of the administrators at great length. And then by the time they left on Wednesday afternoon, they were able to give us kind of a preview of what their report would look like. But again, we didn't receive the report, at least in draft form, until February and then the final report in March. And the process is, it is a 10-year cycle um, that begins with the self-study. And that process was completed a little over a year ago. And then in September, the evaluation visit, which again happens every 10 years, uh, the draft report set in February, the, the determination, which happens by a vote of the commission, that happened in March. And then just in May, we received the highlighted recommendations. Uh, and this begins the follow-up process that will continue for the next uh, now nine years until they visit us again in uh, 2027. And I hope we'll all be here to talk about, uh, about that one and all the good work we've done during the course of, of the follow-up. So um, the report that you've probably had an opportunity to look at by now is very exhaustive. And, and it, there's really a, um, a, a very detailed template that is followed by the group when they visit any school in New England. And it's divided into seven standards and broken down further into 54 indicators. So there are, the, there are the seven standards, starting with core values, beliefs, and learning expectations. That's the shortest uh, because it contains just four indicators. Um, other standards include, of course, curriculum instruction, assessment, culture and leadership, which is the largest one, school resources for learning, and community resources for learning. The, port, the report in its entirety is 100 pages long, exactly. It contains 37 specific commendations. This is in addition to the narrative. There's a, a narrative portion that's written on every one of the standards and every one of the indicators. Um, at the end of each standard, they highlight a series of commendations and issue recommendations as a matter of course. So we almost hit the two to one margin of commendations to recommendations, which I think is a pretty good ratio. Um, and, and, and I think, um, pretty much everybody who, who has read this at, at the school, our faculty, which was shared with them in the spring, and others who I've talked to feel really good, and I really think we, ought, we all should take great pride in, uh, in much of what is in that report. So the, the full report is available and has been available for several months now on the website. A uh, screenshot there of the district's homepage. You can find a link on the district's homepage or on the high school's uh, webpage as well. You would also find there from the same link uh, a letter that came in May from the chair of NEASC uh, that kind of gives a number of highlights and also um, indicates the highlighted recommendations and the, the highlighted um, commendations as well. So next steps. We'll have a special progress report that is due on January 2nd of 2019, so in about six months. That's going to be a report to address one highlighted uh, recommendation. There'll be several other highlighted recommendations that we'll need to provide additional detail for by next October, so October 1st of 2019. That's an automatic. Um, and as we begin that work this fall, 
I, I will be working very closely, in particular with David Jewett, who's our math director, and Christina O'Connor, uh, known to many of you as Miss OC. They both volunteered, um, it didn't take too much coercion, both volunteered to co-chair the work of the follow-up effort. Uh, the three of us attended a follow-up workshop at the NIASC headquarters in the spring to get a little more detail on how that process will work. Uh, but the three of us will work closely and certainly involve uh, a number of other stakeholders as well as we move forward on the follow-up work. Um, the special uh, progress report, as you may know from reading the letter, um, is focused on one particular highlighted recommendation uh, that I've quoted here. I, I didn't want to really take the time to go through all of the highlighted commendations and recommendations since most of you have probably read it already. And for anybody who's watching at home, uh, if you haven't read it already, please uh, take a look at it on the website. Uh, but the one highlighted recommendation that the Commission had thought uh, required some more immediate response um, was uh, as, as follows. Information about action taken to address the development and implementation of a school-wide formal ongoing program or process through which each student has an adult in the school who knows the student well and assists the student in achieving the school's 21st century learning expectations. So uh, that, that's a lot, a lot of words to, I think, say we would like you to have a full mentoring program, not just for freshmen. That, that's really how we're reading it. I certainly do think that all of our students have an adult in the school who, who knows them well, and, and probably in most cases many adults in the school who know them well. Uh, but it's particularly the case for our ninth graders who in addition to having, we would certainly hope, an English teacher who knows them well, a social studies teacher who knows them well, maybe a coach who knows them well, an assistant principal who knows them well, a guidance counselor who knows them well. Uh, some of the survey data has shown that, that some students have said, well, I'm not sure how comfortable I would be talking to an adult in the building about a problem. Uh, if I was having one. And while that may be par for the course for, for teenagers everywhere, uh, our school has been and, and ought to continue looking for, for more powerful ways to allow students to connect with adults in the building. Um, and I think we've made really good progress in establishing a robust freshman advisory program. We have hope to expand that beyond just ninth graders so that all students beyond the ninth grade year would have a mentor. Um, and a formal process. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but that's something that we need to work on and, and we hope we'll, we'll come to a, a more clarity and, and better vision about what that might look like and we have some leverage now, additional leverage uh, because of the recommendation from the NIASC report. Some of the other areas that we'll be focusing on as we look ahead to the two-year progress report that again is expected of all schools that go through this process uh, across New England the focus areas that they ask for particular detail on, and, and we'll have to address all 17 uh, of the recommendations to some extent, but the ones that we'll provide the greatest detail on because they were highlighted, reference, and I didn't give you the full quotations here, you, you can take a look at them in the report, but um, they deal with a common format for written curriculum, which, which already exists, but there's some language in the recommendation around adding a greater emphasis to the school's uh, 21st so-called 21st century learning expectations. Uh, the second highlighted recommendation has to do with curricular coordination between academic areas. Uh, interestingly, we were also cited for a highlighted commendation for vertical uh, curricular coordination. And there was some praise around the school's curricular coordination even at the high school. But they also said we'd like to see more of this. Um, and, and highlight it as something to address in the two-year report. Um, there was a call for greater use of differentiated instruction. Again, this was something which we did receive quite a bit of praise about in the report, but then there was also language saying we would like um, a greater emphasis on all teachers, uh, not just most, but all teachers really doing a good job with differentiated instruction. Um, the fourth highlighted recommendation had to do with communicating to individual students and their families and also to the whole school community the school's progress toward meeting the school's 21st century learning expectations. Those are words that appear again and again and again throughout the report. That's language that um, really is important to the, to the commission and, uh, and they emphasize that in their recommendations. And then um, 
Finally, a call in the fifth highlighted recommendation to develop a policy of regular review and revision of grading practices at the school to ensure that they're aligned with the school's values and, and beliefs. Uh, and there was some concern expressed there around, um, and much of it coming from parent surveys, uh, around uh, some discrepancy between how much work one teacher would give vis-a-vis -vis another or how hard one teacher was perceived to be vis-a-vis -vis another uh, and that sort of thing. So a call for a formal kind of more systematic regular review of grading policies and consistencies uh, across the board. So um, that brings me to my final slide which is adding the stamp of NEASC to the other stamps of uh, the Federal Department of Education and, and since our last accreditation uh, 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago now, the school has, has won a lot of accolades and, and two of the biggest are that green ribbon and the green ribbon from, from the federal level here closer to home at the regional level. We're certainly really proud to say that once again the school has earned its accreditation and has been singled out for a lot of accolades and some really impressive statements within the report that should make all of us feel proud to be part of the district and, and, and a really powerful school community. But we appreciate the fact that we had a really dedicated, hardworking, um, and even visionary team that came in and it worked really hard for us for four days to produce a report that has given us some guidance that uh, I'm sure will help us to continue striving to earn the accolades we've had and to look for ways to keep getting better. So uh, that that's kind of a highlight reel version. I'm not sure if you have questions that you'd like to bring up. That's great. Thank you. All right. Much. My pleasure. Um, I'll open up questions. Carrie? Yeah, uh, just, I want to say congratulations. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading it through. Oh, You're great. doing Thank a lot you. of great things at the high school. Um, I had two questions. The first was, um, and it's not on the list of things that is for the, the mm -hmm. um, two-year progress report, but it recommended um, a plan to develop long-range technology, to develop a long-range technology plan. And I guess this is kind of more our responsibility, the funding to go with it, to make mm -hmm. sure there's full technology support. Have you thought about what you're going to do uh, to work to, to do you make some progress on that front right yeah I think the um, the comment the recommendation that didn't it didn't make that top five list for the two-year report but right. certainly was cited mm -hmm. as a recommendation um, had language around ensure funding to to provide the technology needed to prov you know to support the kind of vibrant education that, that we need to that we need to offer and and that really will be a the community effort in terms of the the funding there but uh, but work that's happening at the not just at our school level but really district wide right. around technology initiatives. Is there a plan that so once there is funding that we? Well, in a sense, you know, it's almost an oxymoron to say a long term technology plan. But in any event, um, you know, we do have a long term vision in terms of we get an amount of money every year in um, in the capital budget towards technology, just the general upkeeping uh, of, uh, of, of devices, um, a plan that uh, includes getting ready for the MCAS that everybody is going to be doing online. So we have those kinds of plans that are district-wide um, district -wide plans. Um, and so um, we can get those, you know, those out to you in writing. But long term, to me, has more to do with sustainability than it has with trying to predict long term exactly what we'll need. Long term really needs making sure there are regular line items in the budget. And there are some, but there could be more. And the difficulty we've had, uh, which I think this, this recommendation and our response to it, can maybe leverage something more at the town side to acknowledge that we don't know everything we'll need. And so when we want to suggest an item in the capital budget in particular for technology improvements or for piloting of things, those things haven't always stayed in the budget because people are looking at what, what exactly are you going to buy as opposed to what are you going to explore and, and play with. So I can see a rec a uh, response to the recommendation around this that um, you know we can we can use to say this is what NES expects and this mm -hmm. is what um, most uh, schools are attempting to do is to be able to be sure that we can maintain what we have but that we have some dollars uh, almost um, 
what's the word, uh, development, almost a development approach as most institutions have to being able to move forward. And, and that's what we don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, well, last budget, year we so. have a line item in there in the capital outlay committee. Like, that was one of the first things right. they mm -hmm. took out was. So they've been willing to, you know, they've been willing it's to not respond mandated, to the, you know, we're like, well, we want to do that. They're like, yeah. no. <laughs> now they've been willing this. to respond to knowing we need <laughs> to up, update um, our labs periodically. And we, and, uh, and we need to update our switches and uh, our access points and those things. And they've been very responsive to that. And we're fortunate not all districts have that. Mm -hmm. They've been responsive to we need more devices to be ready for everyone taking MCAS, you know, simultaneously um, and responding to that. But it's that want to explore. And, and largely, how has that happened here in the past? I would say 80% of it maybe even that's uh, too little, has been a result of the foundation mm -hmm. giving us those kinds of dollars. Mm -hmm. but, but we need to appropriate some dollars like that as well. Yeah. So and we do have a five-year plan, it's in, in, but it's executed annually. You know, that's the, and, and it depends on how the revenues are going. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly project out what we need for five years as enhancement money in the capital budget every one, every year. There's, um, you know, last year there's there's regular ongoing technology um, capital in the budget and there's also right now we're in a five-year program of revamping all of the network switches and, and infrastructure that we built five years ago you know over the next five years so there's sort of three components it's always there but it's executed annually mm -hmm. there's no guarantee we're going to get that money it has to be done during the process within the budget process Hopefully this will help. Yeah. Uh, and then my other question was um, the, pl the recommendation to differentiate instruction. Uh, is there, do you have a plan in place to move that forward? Well, I, I think the, the formal work of the follow-up will happen beginning this fall as we convene a group to, to say how collectively do we want to do this. Mm -hmm. my, my own feeling at this point is that I'm, sh I'm sure it will involve some degree of professional development and sharing of best practices. Um, at faculty meetings, at department meetings. We, we, I was very happy to see that we were um, complimented for some really excellent differentiated instruction and, and a variety of learning activities that appeal to different learning styles in many, many classrooms. And I think the language there was around, let's make sure that it's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. Not just that it's happening a lot, but let's make sure that it's happening constantly. Right, they referenced the multi-level courses. There was good differentiation going on, but not so much, not as much in the other ones. Right. Um, it also mentioned that there are two, only two classes with co that are co-taught. Mm. Do you think that would help with? I, I think so, and that that's a growth area. I'm actually I'm happy to report that that that's one area. As I was reading through the report, I was thinking, okay, good. So a couple of check marks. You can see we're already doing some things and had them in the works before the report even came and co-teaching was one of them mm -hmm. we're actually doubling for next year the number of co-taught classes and it's not a huge number mm -hmm. uh, it's good to say we're doubling it but it's just from two to four right. but that's at least uh, it's a significant increase and yeah. and we remain very very grateful to the support we had in adding an additional special education teacher mm -hmm. this year and so we were able to to triple the number of directed study uh, program that we're offering for regular education students with learning needs. We're doubling the number of co-taught classes and, um, and, and we're slightly reducing the size within our strategies for learning classrooms too, which I think is gonna make an impact, all those things. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thank and you. those came from recommendations that we made in the budget last November. Mm -hmm. so, so, so he's right, we didn't have to report them, but we knew it was an area that, and, and nice to see they mm -hmm. recognize and support it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Carlos? Well, first of all, I just want to, I don't have any questions, but other than just commend you um, for leading us through this process. This was pretty new on your uh, plate. Uh, you had just, you know, been appointed the new principal. Uh, you did an awesome job. Uh, it was great to sit there with other, uh, you know, teachers, administrators, and staff, and be part of the process. So you, you did a fabulous job. Um, you know, it, it, it is great to see that the teachers was, were very open-minded in terms of co-teaching, mm -hmm. and that was good, good to hear, because obviously you've been talking about this in the last few years. So I want to commend you, and um, you know, as you know, I am the new liaison to the high school. You'll be seeing a lot of more of me. Excellent, I look forward to it. report back to the committee that we <coughs> used that band up there. 
That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get another one. Great. Thank well, you very much, Carlos. I, I appreciate that very much. Team effort all the way. And, uh, you know, it's very gratifying to see that uh, the, the hard work has, has paid off. And uh, it's the validation of a lot of the hard work and good things that are happening is as well as some really insightful recommendations that are going to help us moving forward. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. And your team. Thank you Great very job. much. Good luck this year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Um, item 7.2, to receive the proposed school committee meeting dates for 2018 and 2019 act as appropriate. So everybody has the calendar in their packet. Um, trying to cut a few meetings out where we could um, to give a little bit of a break because it's going to be a busy year with other <laughs> subcommittee assignments um, and work um, as well as the always busy budget season time. So um, does anybody see anything in here that's a significant conflict or issue? Um, we may need to add a meeting here or there throughout the year, but I, but we tried to make it as consistent as we could with meetings either once a month or on the second and fourth month, I can't remember the if it was the second, and third. the first, first and the third, and sorry. Third. We were trying to do the first and the third, um, other than the next meeting on September 10th, because we figured Tuesday after Labor Day was not the day to have a school committee meeting <laughs> since it's the first day of school. <laughs> so you guys could use <laughs> trying to get out of here at a normal hour that night. Um, so anyway, so if anybody doesn't have any issues with any of the dates, I did want to, we talked about the last meeting, but Kay wasn't here. Are people interested in start, moving the start time to 7 p.m. still? Yes, 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 yes. Currently, I, I, mean, I don't know my kids' schedule, but I should be able to make it work, yeah. Okay. All right. Do you? I, I'm okay on the time. I'm, okay. What about January the 22nd or the 28th? Yeah, what was that about? I forget why we had the two. Well, the the 22nd is the Tuesday after Martin Luther oh, King right. Day. Because Martin Luther King was late this year. Yeah. So did Versus we? Versus having, oh, it would be our only. Yeah, for the particular, the particular one, I have no problem in meeting on Tuesday. That would be fine with me. Versus the 28th, I know 28th, I'm not going to be around. Okay. The, the other thing we could think about doing is not making that choice now of the 22nd or 28th, but wait until we get into okay. January to see if we yeah. need the second meeting at all. That's another, in other words, leave it like this yep. and make the decision then, or, mm -hmm. or if you feel strongly about change it. Uh, it doesn't matter either way to was here which day what do folks point? think want to wait until we get to january and see if we need that second yeah. meeting we have in the past though scheduled good thought and then canceled yeah i'd rather you know, schedule not, it yeah, we'll not rich agenda, yeah, because we're also you know, that's because we'll have be the budget meetings in the interim there right. so I mean, well but that's I, I like what i mean by just leave it to, alone and when we get to january we could say that we'll right. we either right. time schedule both of them right basically both all right, so <laughs> let's go for <laughs> January 22nd, the Tuesday yeah. after um, Martin Luther King Day. Sounds okay. Does that work mm -hmm. very well? All right. Um, okay. Um, Thank you. All right, so we're doing so. And everybody noted that we have the Saturday meeting, the September 15th. Um, the other meeting that is not here at all, but needn't be on this meeting, but just something we want to talk about on the planning day is um, whether or not we want to have a meeting that in the past has been in November, often the Saturday before Thanksgiving, that either would be for a walk around or would be a meeting with the um, advisory committee to talk about overall thoughts about budget looking ahead, mm -hmm. kind of an introduction for them. So we've done one or the other of those, or one, one year we do both of those on one day. That's not here at all, but it is something we should put on the agenda to talk about at the planning meeting. Okay, yes, on, on the 15th, okay, all right. Also, there's not here, uh, 
last several years, we've done a, um, um, a January meeting with the advisory committee once the budget has been proposed. Um, and yeah, we don't have that the, here. Now, again, it doesn't have to be here because we'll have a separate budget calendar yeah. that will come mm -hmm. out later. All right. Um, I'm not sure if this needs an actual vote or not. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the Can't hurt. <laughs> yeah. school committee regular meeting calendar for the 2018-2019 school year um, as presented with January 22nd. That's the date. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. No opposed? All right. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, all right. Item 7.3, to review the NESDEC school consulting agreement and cost for the superintendent search and to act as appropriate. Are you going to speak yeah. to that? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So at, the pre um, at our last meeting when we met as the full committee part of salary negotiations, I shared with you the contract. And the contract is based on the proposal that they had provided. And um, so there weren't any other comments at that time. Our original budget for looking for a, a consultant was $20,000. And this came in at $14,560. And the funds would, were going to be budgeted out of the building revolving account. Um, and, you know, if we need to try and, I've talked to John and try and keep it in the operating budget as the year goes on. But if we need to, we would take it out of the building revolving account. Um, and then also in the contract, there were some additional fee based options um, that will. We talked about whether or not to do the search brochure and that we chose not to, but to put links online information. Um, and um, I don't believe we'll be doing the hard copy advertising at this point um, because the letters have gone out and not <coughs> online. So we may do additional focus groups and that's something we'll talk about um, at our next meeting. Um, but that's a $365 per group, so we'd still be within our $20,000 budget. Um, and then they offer additional services for once you hire a superintendent, but that's longer term. Um, <coughs> so I, um, I wanted to bring this up in a public meeting just so that we're open, transparent about our search consultant. And... Um, make a motion that we approve the um, consulting agreement with NESDEC for the superintendent <coughs> search in the amount of $14,560. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. All um, in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any nays? No, great. Thank you. Okay, so we will execute that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, item 7.4 to discuss proposed next steps in the superintendent search, search and act as a post. Okay. Um, so this will be quick. Um, I, I apologize for the lateness of the memo. I was on vacation last week and it was a six hour time difference. So, um, but Michelle and I um, were in touch and you all received this in writing today so you have reference to it so on August 13th um, we met as a salary negotiation subcommittee with full school committee participation and at that meeting um, the chair um, announced that Michelle and I will be the liaisons with NESDEC for the operational activities in order to follow through on the um, search um, as a full committee, we edited the announcement letter. We used our Chromebooks and used Google Docs. Um, and the announcement letter has been distributed by NESDEC. And that is now posted on the school committee website under the superintendent search 
page for anyone to see. Um, and that was met on the August 10th deadline, so that's been distributed. Um, we also talked at that meeting that at every uh, step in the process, we'll have a discussion by the full committee of which items will be handled as a full committee or the subcommittee will handle. And we did agree that we would schedule a meeting, another meeting for the salary negotiation subcommittee led meeting for the full school committee. Um, we agreed to the August 30th as the date and our tasks at that meeting um, will be to ta finalize the focus groups um, the salary negotiation subcommittee as a subcommittee talked about this on the 13th as well and we were looking at logistically at the schedule of all the activities happening um, with all the schools in September and early October for and I'm still waiting to get some dates from some of the schools of their open houses so that we can slot that in, but I will have that for us to look at on August 30th. So at that time, the full committee can talk about which focus groups we'll have, which will be open to which groups, um, and the dates, <coughs> and then how to communicate this out to the community. Um, also, the online survey would be live during the time period when we have the focus groups. Um, and so you had all received a draft of the online survey um, at previous meeting. So if you can please look at that and bring any ideas of how we want to update that survey um, for the August 30th meeting, that would be helpful. Um, also, on August 30th, we're going to begin the discussion of how we're going to create the screening committee. Um, we're going to talk about the criteria that we want to recommend for any candidates that want to be considered on the screening committee. Um, we're going to talk about what type of people we want to comprise the screening committee. Um, the numbers of people um, and then once we know that then we will have a discussion about for each of those types of people how those people will be appointed. Um, we did receive communications from the PTO presidents of their suggestion on how we approach this. Um, thank you for the suggestion but we haven't discussed that at all yet so just we'll take that into consideration but um, we can't respond because none of us have talked about it yet so um, and then we'll also at that meeting talk about the the timetable for the creation of the screening committee um, another thing we should talk about at that meeting is a communication plan a little bit of, of all these pieces how do we want to communicate the steps um, and then and then we'll also have an updated working timeline to come out of that meeting um, so that's going to be a real working session so <coughs> I will prepare some documents that the subcommittee had talked about to help us work through all these steps. And I will get that to people um, by Friday so that you have time over the weekend to take a look at it and work through it. Um, and Michelle and I um, worked up an announcement. We brought it tonight. We were still working on it today. <laughs> um, to a summary of that the fact that the announcement letter for the job um, was done and is posted and I, I can share this all with you but um, so it's um, we drafted this with NESDEC because um, 
for their help in announcing that the announcement letter was distributed by them. And then it goes on to say, among the most important components of the search is community involvement and outreach. And with that in mind, the school committee has created a superintendent search page on the district website so that that message is out there to people. And then we repeated the paragraph about the community needs assessment process with the focus groups. And then we have in early September, the school committee will announce the dates, times, and locations of the community focus group meetings that will take place in late September and early October. And NESDEC will lead the focus groups with residents, parents, students, community leaders, and staff at all levels of the um, town offices, including the school department. Um, and then the web-based survey will be available. Um, and then there's boilerplate information about how to apply to the job if you're interested in applying. And then the two paragraphs we've included before of the boilerplate of the process and hang in public schools. So um, we wanted to have that to accompany the announcement letter. That there's an explanation of what this announcement letter is and then some information about the fact that the focus groups will be will be happening and more information will come. So um, so we'll get that one out. So we can send that around to everyone. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is the page going to be a page from the school committee website or a totally separate page? There's, there are a number There's, of documents now on the school committee. So the superintendent page. search page is it's part of the school committee page but it's okay. its own uh, link it, on the yes. news okay. part of the the website okay yeah. so um, so I can send that to all of you tonight um, it's pretty straightforward um, or if you guys are okay with us just getting that out um, are you okay with us getting it out okay thank you I was going over the notes from the last full school committee meeting in July, and one task that we had to do is decide who is going to be the official spokesperson for the superintendent search. So I don't know if, you, if Michelle or if you're going to appoint someone or if we should talk about that at the next meeting, but that was something that NASDAQ had recommended. Yes, you are correct. I think I was thinking that that was sort of the same as the liaison, but it actually is a separate role because for spokesperson outside of right. conversations with NASDAQ. Um, Yes, let's do that at the, the end of the third meeting. Okay. okay, but thank you. There's no one quoted in this okay. one. Um, and um, I also just wanted to make a comment. I saw an email that came out tonight um, from the Hingham High School PTO about that is from Hingham Public Schools All Town PTO. And um, there's some information in here. This is advocating for um, that the leaders of the six PTOs um, are advocating for certain people to be on the screening committee. Um, but there's also some information in here that says, um, you'll also be hearing about focus groups being held in the next few weeks. These groups assist our search consultants in getting a profile of ideal candidates for Hingham. The consultants will take the feedback from the community and select the top 15 or so candidates who meet the characteristics the town is looking for and turn these candidates over to the screening committee. Unfortunately, this information is not accurate. Um, we specifically as a school committee voted not to work with a consultant in that manner and that we wanted to work with a consultant and we have every intent that the screening committee will be the ones to screen every single application that is received and then that screening committee will narrow down candidates to how, what a reasonable number that they will interview and then narrow that down the screening the only the screening committee will interview candidates and then they will recommend to the full school committee four or five candidates that would then be made public um, 
and so I just wanted to make sure that this was clear to the community and and uh, I'll be reaching out to people to clarify this information um, because um, just to make sure that we're all everybody understands the process that we're going through um, is this an email that came to you this was distributed from the Hingham High School PTO to members uh, to parents so you got and it as a parent okay yeah. we didn't okay not to us right no because we don't have kids in the system and we did not work with them to we would like to work with you to provide any information that you would like to get out to parents um, but we just really want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that it's accurate um, so, sure. so come on up. So is this just a question? Did NESDEC not say that they are taking all of the um, applications they receive and going through them and selecting the top fifteen? No, they're not doing that. They are. But they did. She did say that a couple of meetings ago that they are gonna because that's why they're doing the focus group to. S so then what's no. the point of the focus group the if they're not going to the select out the... The point of the focus groups is to... Um, NESDEC is going to run the focus groups, mm -hmm. and then they are going to compile all of the information received at the focus groups to create a candidate profile for us so that it's the, I, that's telling, con consolidating all the information so that we have a profile of what our community wants in a superintendent right so every and then that profile will be used to measure the applications we receive but NESDEC will not be deciding on whether a candidate meets the profile or not the screening committee will so if there's have. 60 applications that come through there's going to be 60 the screening committee will go, have to read go through all yep my understanding was NESDEC was going to eliminate, it was going to make sure everyone has the appropriate credentials, like so if they don't have their license or th something like that, then right, that seems go to sort the of they would they will they will add their they will read them, and from what I understand, they will read them, but they're not going to eliminate anybody. They might comment on them for checking that, okay. but they're not eliminating anybody for us. I think there might be some so when Carolyn was here presenting. My recollection in the notes were, was she was explaining to the, co the full committee yes. all the services they provide, yeah. and then it was up to the committee to then pick the services they want. It makes sense because she did say, that in fairness, yes. in the presentation, yes. she did explain that we could do, do X, that. but right. that's not what our committee chose to have them do. Okay. That makes sense. No, it does make sense, yeah. but also it makes sense for them to definitely sort out some right off the bat that wouldn't. But that hasn't been decided yet. Yeah. It hasn't been okay. decided. No, but they, they, okay. can, they can tell you, here they all are, want to let you know these five are not licensed. Yeah. Right, right. so they're just going to collect it and but pass it on. They're not going to do any sort of... Right. Okay. Right. I mean, they'll review them, and they might say, just so you know, these 10 don't really have... If you were looking for a PhD, these 10 don't have that. So up to you, screening committee. But also, we haven't had that specific detailed conversation with them yet because we're going through each individual stage of this. So what we do know is that NESDEC is going to run the focus groups and compile all that information mm -hmm. for us. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this focus groups as early as we are, because they need a couple of weeks to compile the information. And so we won't get that profile back until the end of October. Right. Okay. I just, again, it was something that was discussed at one of the meetings. Um, okay, so. We, we had the discussion when we received proposals from the search consultants. Mm -hmm. There were search consultants that that was the service they offered. And we didn't want, we wanted to have control at every, or input at every step of the process. Right. Right, because some of the firms said oh no we don't let you look at all of them yeah. we'll give you the best and the brightest right. but we were like I don't, but who but are NESDEC you going to decide that who's the best and brightest it might not yeah. be who this community believes is the yeah. best and brightest and NASDAQ is everything is going to them we're not we're not receiving anything right and then they're passing it on yeah okay all right, all right. okay thank you
you have a question, Sarah? Hi, again, Sarah Abbott. Um, so quick question, and I just want to say thank you, Liza. The outline is great. It's very thorough, and you're doing a lot, both you and Michelle. Can you tell me who's on the screening committee and who's on the community outreach subcommittee? So the community outreach subcommittee is Kay and Carrie and Libby Lewicki. Awesome. And, um, but the screening committee, we don't know who's on the <coughs> screening committee. We haven't decided it. Oh, okay. That is... Um, by. We're going to talk about that on August 30th, um, but we're also going to talk, we're not going to name names on August 30th. On August 30th, we're going to talk about what kind of people do we want to have on the committee who, and the types of people are people that know what a superintendent does and all the different aspects of a superintendent's job and that they can ask a question of a candidate and listen to the answer and understand whether that answer is answering their question right. accurately. And so we've reached out to the leadership, to the principals, and we've told them, we're probably going to want somebody from your group. We're going to want, you know, staff, different le levels of staff. Um, We'll so probably we'll have, well, there'll be school committee members on it, um, but parents, have parents, but we don't know how many. Um, we don't know, like, what other, you know, CPAC representation, people from town, people from the advisory committee, people, the police chief, maybe, the, that's what we're going to talk about on August 30th. But we cups. also don't want to make it too big if we have been advised by NESDA. Right not to make it too big because they can't do their job. Too many cooks in the uh, kitchen, yeah. Right. Exactly. So, um, you know, we've heard from 9 to 16 people that we have to make it so that it also works for Hingham. And then we'll also decide how are we going to get the people that we want because the people on the screening committee will have very specific responsibilities of confidentiality, mm -hmm. um, of time commitment, and so we're going to, I'm going to draft up for everybody. Here's the sheet of what are we all in yeah. sync on? This is what we expect of the people that want to even be on this. So if we, they can we go back to your comment that you already received information from people who are interested to be considered? Sorry, no, she meant, no. you meant, Nez, she meant Ned's no. deck. Oh, okay. Ned's deck recommends nine and to how 15 do, people um, on it, max. And so for anyone else that would want to be considered like that's watching tonight that may not be the first person that comes to mind through their principal or something else, how should they best contact you to say, I'm interested in being considered and this is why I think I'm qualified? That's one of the things we're going to talk about on August 30th. Okay. Of how are we going to reach out to people and if there's another group that's going to appoint, you know, we'll know the types of people we want on the committee. Yeah. But we don't know if we will accept an application for those types of people or if we will ask another organization or group to appoint somebody. Okay. That's another topic that we have to talk I about. I do hope that, oh, go ahead. Did you want to say oh, well, something? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to add also, that's another reason why we're having the focus groups yeah. is so because the screening committee is going to be limited in numbers, right. we're not going to be able to take everyone but, on that right. may be interested. So that's the reason for the survey. That's the reason for having these focus groups so that really Anyone in this community can have input I agree. and be heard. And, well, having just also, done this with yeah. our own principal at Foster yeah. School and yeah. understanding the process, I totally respect and understand and get that. I just think I hope that you'll take into consideration the PTOs and what we're doing and how we're working with all of the parents, no, and uh, in addition to the administration and staff at the schools. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. The, there'll be parents on the, the right, but the I'm hoping that you're going to have a fair representation of parents with children maybe who've graduated but also parents with young children yeah. so that there's a yes. broad yes demographic so, yes. Yes. so that's what we're yeah, that's what we're that's the intention and I think it's also when you realize that you are being limited to potentially nine to 13 right. or 14 yeah. people it's like you also need to make sure you're getting people who wear a couple of hats right 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 not just you know it has to be a parent who has several kids maybe in different schools different oh, yeah. levels right all that so yes. okay so it's a big thanks thanks for all yeah. you're doing yeah, yeah. No, so we're we're you. really we got to 
figure out all this preliminary <laughs> stuff <laughs> before we yeah. can ask people who want, and I have had people tell me I want to be on the screening committee, and I have told them, great, when I know whether or not we're accepting applications, I'll let you know, but I It would be nice to sort of open it just to see who else is interested oh, in maybe yeah. getting involved yeah. in the community. Yeah. yeah. And no, then absolutely. else, the other chance to be involved is once we have the finalists, those will be all public meetings, and so people can come and hope and ask questions or give us the questions they want to ask and watch it and participate. I expect it'll be very similar to how we handled it with the principal, just on a much grander scale. Right. So yes. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. No, thank you. And it is, a, I mean, just for those who think like, oh, I want to be on that screening committee, we will also be letting people know exactly how much of a time commitment it is because it is a lot and there's a certain window of time you'll have to be mm -hmm. available to do things because the worst thing you can do is get 14 people and then one person's like, oh, I'm so sorry I can't make that meeting even though it was already, so they have to be very mindful. So when people are interested in being on it, they do have to understand the time commitment that's involved in it. So, all right. Um, Anything else on? I think that's the it updates? for now. So okay. you'll get more information from me. And NASDAQ is joining us on the 30th um, right. to help us um, to facilitate the conversation of everything we have to get I think done. We might need two days. <laughs> well, I think hopefully we did some work on the focus groups, and there's a, there's only a limited amount of stuff we can schedule on the focus groups so hopefully that part we can get that done kind of <laughs> yes. quickly so all right um all right item 7.5 to consider the homeschool application of cassette youngton oh sorry i don't think i should do that but we have a homeschool application was it in the repeat application folder mm -hmm. a repeat application go ahead yes. okay it's in your packet okay packet. all right um any I'll make a motion to approve the homeschool application of Cassette Youngton grade 9 for the 2018-2019 school year. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so moved. Um, item 7.6 to hear changes to the warrant authorization process and act as appropriate. John sent us a memo. Yeah, it was actually a memo from Aisha to me. Um, yeah, back a couple of years, the um, <clears throat> back a couple of years ago, the law changed. Prior to this law change, we always we needed a uh, majority of the school committee to sign accounts payable warrants or departmental bill warrants. Um, and in the November seventh, the law changed, which really gave the school committee authority to vote a single representative to sign these warrants, and we don't have to bring the warrants at the uh, the end of a meeting, and try to gather four people all together. It would be good if it was, um, and we similarly we we do that for payroll today, you know. Said, um, but the payroll has been longer standing than accounts payable. This law recently changed. And I each just said, hey, should we, we, should we do this? And I said, yeah, this could be a good time for us to, you know, make a recommendation to the committee to adopt this, whereby the committee would vote one person to sign accounts payable warrants. I wouldn't have to bring them here to meetings, which I have a big stack here for you know, to gather four signatures. Um, it would be good if it was a person that came into the office frequently or you know more uh, more than others, and you know had a few minutes to sort of look at the the warrant and you know review it. Um, the law also required that they would just give a report, but in that sense, that report would be on um, you know I, I signed this warrant. Uh, the warrant um, is a number, and it always starts with S, and it's followed by the date, and it's typically a Friday. So you know it would be 08. Um, you'd say you know S 08 24 18. And um, the amount of the warrant, you'd see what the amount was, and so I also included in here a template of the of what the report would be if the committee member were, were to make that report. Um, I think it could facilitate the warrant process better. Um, it, you know, the, bringing the bring the warrants at the end of these meetings that's not bad either. But you know, people want to do other things at the end of the meeting. You know, aside from signing these warrants, so. I thought that it would be a, a, a good idea to, you know, take advantage of this. So basically what would happen if we were to do this is the committee would 
really vote for one person to be that representative um, to come in. The warrants would always be available. They're available to anybody, but that person could come in, sign the warrant, similar to the way Michelle today, I think, signs the payrolls. Liza's Eliza signed payrolls. Um, any selected representative that's voted by the committee could, in fact, be the sole signature signer of these warrants and report it out at the next meeting or next couple of meetings. So that's what this recommendation is, um, and I think it's a good idea. John, do we have? Uh, it's in our policy manual that the chair or the chair's designee signs the payroll um, warrants. Should we be voting that person? Like, should we vote that the chair does it each year or by law? Um, you, you can vote that you could vote the chair if you wanted. We, we don't no, have to. No, I mean, to. They, this is yeah. the, our payroll supposed to be follow under this law of that we vote the person in? Um, actually, Sorry. it wasn't always the chair or the vice chair of the payroll. It tended right. to be a person we had for many yeah. years who was in the office a lot. Yeah. And so, uh, but since that person had left, it, it became the role of Well, and um, then we the wrote it that it was the chair and or the chair's designee. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I mean, I don't care who. I'm not picky about who does it. I'm just wondering if we're following the law or not. <laughs> we're having the chair well, sign the, the law. The law for this one is if, if the committee by majority votes a single person, that person can be that person authorized to sign the law. For warrants. both payroll and expense. Well, this one, this one, um, this is just I'm talking just about departmental bills. Yeah. Um, which would be the accounts payable warrants. Because we already we already have a process in place for the okay. payroll, so I'm not okay. suggesting that we change okay. payroll. Okay. Okay. I'm su right. suggesting that this just be for okay. warrants, um, accounts payable warrants, which is all of our departmental bills. Okay. We do one every week. Yeah. Um, I think there's 53 in the course of a year, um, and and you know many of you that've been here for years, you see, I give you the stack at the end of the night and. You know, okay, let me sign these and stuff, but there's other things we want to talk about at the end of these meetings. So I, I think this could <laughs> <laughs> I think this could help facilitate things better. But if you if you need it <laughs> not are you nominating someone? <laughs> <laughs> it would be good for somebody that comes into the office yes. frequently or is around or is available. You know? But if you made it the chair or designee, then in a given year the Chair, if it weren't convenient for that person to do it, could designate some of the people. And can it be? Um, so the chair, <coughs> let's say it was the chair and, or their designee, and then that. So sometimes the chair, if available, could sign things. But at weeks that that, that person weren't, it could be. So at any time, it wouldn't just be like one person has to be yeah, designated I, at the beginning of each fiscal budget to say, okay, for the next. 365 days, it's Carlos da Silva. <laughs> if that's you not don't have to do that. No, if that's I think we could do that. Mind. I think that would be fine if it was the chair or designee, so okay. long as the designee was decided yeah. who that other per who that alternate person would ah, be. Got it. Okay. Right. All right. Do we want to do this at okay. our next meeting so people can nominate themselves? If they sure. Um, we can do or that. Or do you want to do it now? Anybody want to do it? Mr. Dr. Schreier. <laughs> You are in, you are interested, okay? And you because you're in, you come in to the office once a week, at least. Okay, <laughs> all right. No, that would be. Well, why don't we do it as the chair and Ed? Just okay. because, just in case you have a week when you're not, somebody can't do it. Then. Right. Okay. It would be his backup. Okay, that sounds good to me. All right. All right. So, does somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to a point. Dr. Schreier as the uh, person signing the warrants uh, on behalf of the school committee with uh, Michelle Ayer being the, sec uh, the, um, okay. the backup. I'll second that. Thank you. All right. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. No one opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. All right. Um, and thank you, Ed and Carlos for nominating him. Um, all right, section se point, uh, 7.7, .7, to receive a lot of notifications of the following teachers, all effective for August 27th. 
Um, Laura Bennett will be joining Hingham High School School Psychologist Chair as Chair. Jessica Brainscree, Hingham Middle School <laughs> Counselor. Carolyn Cuella, uh, Hingham Middle School Health. Karen Costello, East School Special Education. Jacqueline Goodman, Foster School Adjustment Counselor. Corey Ouellette, uh, Hingham Middle School Special Education. Melissa Tompkins, East School Music. And Brittany Tor Torig, South School. Welcome all of you, thank you for joining the district. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Um, section 7.8, to receive notification of the appointments of Carol's Florian as our METCO director. Welcome again. Robert Ford and Antoine Villeneuve, bus drivers. Catherine Shaw and Barbara Cullen, Central Office Administrative, Administrative Assistants. Jane Green, Central Office Executive Assistant. Kathleen Silvaggi, Cafeteria Manager at PRS. Richard Tourig, Lead Custodian at East School. And Nancy Brandy, Office Paraeducator at PRS. Welcome to all of those staff members as well. Um, and then we have 7.9, receiving some resignations. Um, Mark McNulty, South School Teacher. Dale Willis, Bus Driver. Angela Hoy, HHS Paraeducator. And Nicole Harrison, HHS Paraeducator. Um, we thank them all for their service and wish them well in their future endeavors. Um, item eight, any items 48 hour? Not reasonably known in 48 hours? Nothing over there? All right, great. Um, subcommittee and project reports. We've heard salary negotiation. I don't think policy is met. Policy and met actually was on July 20th, I believe, was the last yep. meeting. So okay. we don't have anything set now for the next meeting. Um, I'll be putting an agenda together and reach out to those members. The next school uh, community outreach meeting is on September 10th. That'll be the first uh, subcommittee meeting uh, with the new members. Um, that'll take place at 9 a.m. Okay, great. So. Oh, I did have one salary negotiations item. Um, Dr. Gell updated us at our subcommittee meeting about research she's been doing on the HR director position, and she had a lot of information. Which she'll be very happy to hear, and we're going to talk about it further at the planning meeting. Um, September 15th because that will be part of the budget cycle but a lot and then she's been doing a lot of work on consolidating that job description so Very that nice. was an update that I thought you <laughs> oh. Okay, so no, no. Uh, and oh, sorry. oh um, for community outreach I was going to attend oh. there's a presentation it was on September 4th I just want to let the other members know that I will be going to that um, oh, it's I'm going on to the, the webinar thing yes yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna um, so social media give us policy. Some interest, a topic of interest, and it was a convenient time except for staff because it's the first day of school, but right. we would welcome you joining us. So just so the viewers know, it's a web webinar on basically social media use, and since we have discussed doing some kind of policy if needed, um, this might be educational for Legal school committee members too. about uh, yeah. what we can do, what we can't do, uh, right. but particularly with re relevance to uh, Staff, faculty, staff, teachers. Wow. Kind of okay. have to miss it, but. Okay. Um, Carlos, do you have any long range yeah, planning lo update? Long range planning. Uh, we met on July 20th. We had a very productive meeting. Um, you know, at Shreya helped us, you know, uh, get the application uh, for the CPC. So we have you know, uh, completed the, uh, well, actually, John and his staff has completed the pre preliminary application and they'll be sent uh, to CPC by the 24th. Yay. It's already in. It's, it's already, already in, great. Yay. Thank um, you. And then uh, Libby and myself will be actually listed as the individuals of contact uh, and, send, and hopefully send the final application uh, by next month. That will be next month, I believe. Yep. September 24th, I believe. Okay. Um, we John, uh, how much can we say on the, uh, so John updated us on the RFQ uh, process mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the design service of the clerestory windows. Did I say it right? Yep, clerestory windows. Uh, so we are now in the process of uh, identifying uh, some uh, candidates that will be interviewed uh, on the 20th of September. Correct, yeah. That, uh, that's gone out to bid. So, I mean, with the, the and we probably sent out maybe 20, uh, I would say conservatively between 
12 and 20 um, requests for the specs already. You know, and, and on August 22nd, um, Wednesday, we'll have a brief, we'll have a meeting at the high school for any designer interested to see the job. So we'll get a bit, it's not mandatory, but we'll get a good turn of designers so they get a feel for, uh, a look for what the project's going to be. And then um, you're correct, uh, we're scheduled in the spec, I put that schedule as um, September 20th for the interviews. Great. But prior to that, we'll do screening and And, and we, we like have that. a meeting scheduled for, from 4 to 5, right? Long range. The yes. same day. Oh, yes. yes. And uh, John also updated us on uh, several facility projects in progress. Uh, some of them, uh, the uh, school security manual has been updated and sent to printed. That was like a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Is that almost done, pretty much? Uh, I expect to have them in next week. Um, and he'll be uh, they're in the process of removing the electrical cap at the middle school. Remember we talked about the electrical cap? Um, so that's, I don't know if you do have an update on that. I don't that. have an update on that. No, no problem. Uh, so s several other things um, that is taking place, you know, especially, you know, uh, for your information, the air handle at the high school, that makes a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. um, so John is going to be, you know, John's team is going to be addressing that and, and they will be replacing that um, with, a, you know, a different, you know, yeah, he already fixed that. That's oh, fixed. great. So now the, the so noise is reduced. So we can hopefully see if a convocation, we're going to see a whole different high So school. hopefully a drummer won't be complaining about the noise anymore. <laughs> and uh, what else, John? Uh, let's see here. Uh, in the, then there's the weed uh, process at the foster school. <coughs> so the South, uh, our uh, the South Shore Country Club uh, staff, w what is it? The facility individuals they will be taking care of that. Um, I believe so. Yeah, I'm not. I don't have it. All right. So that's pretty much where that we was are. A couple weeks uh, ago. I would suggest that we uh, we right. keep an eye on dates of meetings for CPC because it will be important for a couple of us to show up at each of the meetings they have to answer questions and advocate for um, this funding of uh, of a playground, um, Plymouth River, in fact, to move forward with the recommendations for the uh, ADA compliance. And we also want to thank uh, the uh, East School PTO for helping us out with the uh, irrigation process there. They have actually helped uh, fund. Um, so that that is a great thing. So right. many thanks to them for that. I'm not sure if that's completed, but I know that was in progress. So hopefully we'll be able to grow grass and it'll work. That's great. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, special Ed subcommittee meeting, I'm going to, if September 12th works for you both, um, I'll send you an email, um, to have our next Special Ed subcommittee on September 12th before the CPAC meetings, that's the night of their meeting, and Dr. Venice will be at that CPAC meeting, so, um, so I'll put an agenda together and get that date on your calendars. Okay. Um, I think that's it for subcommittee reports. Item number 10, adjournment, do I have a motion to... Adjourn. to adjourn. Yeah. Second. Carrie seconded. Thank you. Our next meeting will be September 10th at 7 p.m. Good luck to everybody going back to school and happy school year, everyone. Meeting adjourned.